Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's fourth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Transportation, chaired by Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez. I've been joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Debbie Rose, Councilmember Adrian Adams, and others will probably be joining us shortly. Today we will hear from the Taxi and Limousine Commission and the Department of Transportation. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, our Committee Councils, Rebecca Chasen and Noah Brick, Deputy Directors, Regina Pareda ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Head, Chima Obacheri, Finance Analyst, John Basile, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Taxi and Limousine Commission. We hold this hearing against the backdrop of today's initial public offerings by Uber, which follows closely on the heels of Lyft's own offering at the end of March. For app-based for hire vehicle companies, business is clearly booming. However, despite the important minimum pay rules that recently went into effect thanks to the Council's legislation, for hire vehicle drivers are largely being left out. Meanwhile, the flood of app-based transportation options has permanently altered the city's transportation landscape and left the street hail drivers and also medallion owners in a precarious position. Traffic is up and demand is down. The state's staged introduction of congestion pricing only on TLC vehicles for now, with private cars not to follow until 2021, has further exacerbated existing challenges. None of this is news exactly. There are no easy answers. The New York City, the Taxi and Limousine Commission is a tiny part of the city's budget, less than 0.06%, but it sits on top of a ticking time bomb. Nevertheless, I wanted to use my remarks this morning, or this afternoon actually, to offer the Taxi and Limousine Commission the council's partnership in addressing these many uh, problems. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Idanis Rodriguez, for his statement, and then we will hear from Bill Heinzen, acting commissioner of TLC. Thank you, Chair Drone, and eh, antes de comenzar, quiero dar la Yo quiero agradecer los estudiantes que están visitándonos y bienvenido al Consejo Municipal de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Son el futuro, Nueva York de inmigrantes, no importa cómo llegamos, y estamos aquí para apoyarlo en todo lo que ustedes necesiten. So you are the future of our city. It doesn't matter when and how we come here. The Statue of Liberty always is there sending, sending the signal that this city, this nation has been built for immigrants and should be by immigrants and it should be for immigrants too. Gracias y sigan para adelante. Ustedes son los ingenieros y los líderes del futuro. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the City Council Finance Committee in the Transportation Committee's joint hearing on the fiscal 2020 executive budget. My name is Idanis Rodriguez, chairman of this committee. I have the privilege, and I have the privilege of chairing the Transportation Committee. Before we begin, I would like to thank the chair of the Committee on Finance, Council Member Danny Drone, for the great job that he's doing in this committee and as a leader in our city. We are here to continue the fiscal 2020 budget process a process we hope will lead to the adoption of a budget that is progressive, responsible, and fair for all New Yorkers. We will start by hearing testimony from the Tax and Limousine Commission 
followed by the city departments of transportation. Since we have members here that represent the, the drivers and the labor industries and others, I want to be sure that the new leadership on the, T on the TLC, as they share with us information about this budget, they should know that we need to save the industry. We need to be sure that uh, all the taxi drivers, yellow, black, and liberal, they should know that we are here to support them for the great services that they provide. Queremos recordarle a que en esta audiencia, TLC, mientras está escuchando los testimonios, entienda de que este presupuesto nosotros queremos que refleje lo que es un esfuerzo de salvar a la industria de taxi, que los taxistas libres, amarillo y black car necesitan saber que ellos no están huérfanos y que nosotros estamos aquí para ayudarlo. Today we will hear from the acting TLC Commissioner Bill Hemson. Congratulations and thank you for your new responsibility on the TLC expense budgets for fiscal 2020. TLC's proposed fiscal 2020 expense budget totals 51.7 million. Major actions in TLC executive budgets include a saving of 5.5 million due to lower than anticipated demand for accessible street hail license. The committee look forward to hearing about the future of this program under a new uh, restructuring. Since TLC issued its first for hire vehicle based licenses to Uber in 2011, ad based companies have dramatically increased in popularity. The committee is interested in hearing about changing trends in the taxi cab industry, including the growth of higher volume for hire vehicles and TLC outlook on the future of this driving industry and its impact on green street hill and medallion taxes. I hope also that at some point during this budget and follow, we can have a conversation about how TLC can work together with all and other state, uh, stakeholders, uh, such as the Black Car Fund, to continue expanding the mental health program that the Black Car Fund already announced in the last, last week. Budget for, followed by TSC, we will hear from DOT Executive Spence, budget for fiscal 2020, which is approximately 1.9 billion, a 4.2 percent, percent increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. The increase is associated with various new needs, including the addition of 300 new school zone speed cameras and the addition of new traffic enforcement agents to combat placard abuse. The committee looks forward to hearing updates on these important transportation initiatives. In addition, DOT's 10-year capital strategy is 16.1 billion for fiscal years 2020, 2029, of which 9.4 billion is budgeted in fiscal years 2020, 2023. We hope the department will discuss its goals and prioritize for the next four years, as well as the scope and progression of work for Vision Zero project and the reconstruction of the BQE Cantil Liber. I also would like, as, and we'll hear later on from DOT, to hear how the city is ready to work with a more increase of funding so that as we are ready to pass a bill for the Vision Zero redesigning, DOT should also have more resources to be able to do all those projects. With that, we go back to Chairman John. Okay, I'm gonna ask council to swear the panel in and then we will hear testimony. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay, and just before we let you testify, I just want to announce that we've been joined by Council Member Steve Matteo, our minority leader, uh, Council Member uh, Donovan Richards, Council Member Chaim Deutsch, and Council Member Barry uh, Grudenchik. And, and Council Member Van Bramer. Okay. Yep. If you don't mind, let me also thank the staff from my office, uh, 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 
Got Tomás Garita, Evelyn Collado in the transportation staff, Jane, jo Giovanni, Rick, Abelo, Emily, Rooney, Elio, Lane, for also doing the great job in uh, the commuter transportation in my office. Okay, please, I'm sorry. We've also been joined by, uh, we're joined by Councilman Marino, so please begin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, Chair Drum and Chair Rodriguez. Uh, Chair Drum, I appreciate your offer of continued partnership uh, with the Council. I think, as I'm gonna discuss today, I think our, our partnership that we've had going back over the years, including when um, we reported to Chair um, Rodriguez uh, a few years ago has been very fruitful and has delivered really good results for people in New York City. Um, and Chair Rodriguez, as we discussed, we're certainly happy to um, meet with you after this just to discuss goals and, I, and vision going forward for this agency and uh, the input you had. I also wanna uh, say hello to the students up in the balcony, a very excited uh, that you're here. I hope, I hope this portion of the testimony doesn't bore you too much, but I did wanna tee off um, Chair Rodriguez's comments about immigrants and immigration. One of the really amazing things about our industry, the taxi and limousine industry in New York City, is we have 205,000 drivers whom we license, and over 95% of them are immigrants. So our, the drivers that we license come from over 25, 125 different countries. Um, so we, uh, we're not the Office of Immigrant Affairs, but we are an agency that has direct contact with um, a significant number of uh, the immigrant population in New York City, and we take that very seriously. Um, the industries we regulate have traditionally been uh, a means for people who come from other countries to establish themselves, to make money. I know there are people in this audience who no longer drive, but who did drive at one point in their career. Uh, and that's something that we're always mindful of. It's an important mission, and that's something we want to continue. So good afternoon, and good afternoon to members of the Finance and Transportation Committees. I am Bill Heinzen. I'm currently the Acting Commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I'm here today to present the TLC's proposed executive budget for fiscal year 2020. With me today are Deputy Commissioner for Finance Administration, Jennifer Tavis, and also Assistant Commissioner for Finance Administration, Vincent Chin. Um, the TLC's budget for fiscal year 2020 is $51.6 million. As Chair Drum alluded to, it's a small budget. We're a small agency. Um, however, we do, we are in the middle of a vast and changing industry and the decisions that we have made and that we make in partnership with the council have a huge impact, not just on the drivers and the industries we regulate, but on all New Yorkers. We're confident that this amount it will help us meet the agency's goals of promoting safe, reliable, and accessible for higher transportation, while at the same time providing excellent service to our licensees and ensuring that our TLC licensed drivers are paid and treated fairly by the companies they work with. As I said, the TLC now licenses over 205,000 drivers and over 135,000 vehicles. On a typical day, our drivers transport over 1 million passengers safely and reliably across our city. Um, that's more than the daily trips um, that the Washington DC metro system offers, just for some scale. Given the large number of licensees we regulate and the tremendous number of passengers they transport, the work of the TLC is vital to the well-being of New York City. And I wanna update you on a few important initiatives at TLC that I know are of particular interest to the City Council. These initiatives that I'm going to report to um, were begun in partnership with City Council and also under the leadership of our former chair, Mirazoshi, uh, and we are grateful to her for her leadership in setting and beginning those initiatives, and we intend to continue, to them, continue them. These initiatives concern our efforts to expand driver pay protections beyond those currently existing for yellow taxi drivers to the largest for hire vehicle companies, the unprecedented growth of the for hire vehicle industry, the impacts that growth has had on our drivers and the city, 
as well as the TLC's efforts to ensure access for all passengers, regardless of race, of destination, whether or not the person uses a wheelchair, or other illegitimate factors. You have supported the important work that the TLC has done in these areas uh, in partnership with the mayor, and you've given us the necessary tools to address them. First, I want to give you an update on driver income. In July 2018, the TLC reports, released a report on the economics of the app dispatching companies, prompted by concerns with how these corporations were compensating drivers. The report found that app drivers, like many TLC drivers, have high expenses because they take on most of the business costs and risks, particularly the costs of purchasing or le leasing a vehicle, maintaining it, and insuring it. When these expenses are factored into determining a driver's net pay, the study concluded that 85% of drivers who drive for the four app companies in New York City were earning less than the equivalent of the city's minimum wage. Based on that report and following Local Law 150 of 2018 uh, that was enacted over the summer, TLC adopted rules in December 2018 to expand pay protection for drivers working for the four largest FH for hire vehicle companies, specifically Uber, Lyft, Via, and Juno, each of which dispatches over 10,000 trips every day. These companies are now categorized as high volume for hire services under Local Law 149, which was also enacted last year, and which requires that these companies apply for a separate license to do business in New York City. The rules TLC passed require these high volume service providers to pay drivers a minimum amount for each trip based on the trip's actual time and distance. The rates are set to ensure that after expenses, drivers are earning at least the equivalent of $17.22 an hour, which was the independent contractor equivalent of a minimum wage uh, with additional for um, allowing people, we hope, to take some time off. These rules went into effect on February 1st, 2019. And while it's early, the results have been a significant victory for workers in New York City. As of April 28th, drivers have earned over $150 million in additional income. This is something that the mayor and the council have done together. I think this is a major accomplishment and I think we should all be proud of it. Monitoring and enforcement are obviously critical to the success of the driver pay rules and we will continue running administrative data analysis to ensure that all drivers receive the pay they are owed. Our analysis did identify trips, most of them just after the rules took effect, in which drivers were underpaid. TLC has sent di directives to the companies to ensure that the drivers are paid any additional money owed. In addition to seeking restitution for underpayment, TLC can seek monetary and non-monetary penalties for non-compliance. In addition to this administrative enforcement that we perform, any drivers who believe they may have not received proper payment can use the uh, driver pay calculator, which is located on TLC's homepage to determine the minimum pay due to them. Drivers who receive payment less than that required by our rules should not hesitate to contact TLC, specifically our driver protection unit. You can contact our driver protection unit in several ways. You can call 311, you can um, call our driver protection hotline, which is 718-391-5539. You can email us at driver protection at tlc.nyc.gov, or you can meet with TLC staff in person or any combination of these. Our driver protection unit protects drivers' rights by investigating complaints filed by drivers of underpayment, lease overcharges, and fraud. We've recently expanded it from working with um, yellow taxi and traditional for hire vehicle drivers to make sure that it's working with all drivers. As a result of all the driver complaints that we've received to date, the Driver Protection Unit has so far helped dri taxi and for hire vehicle drivers get back more than $3.2 million. I also want to talk about the vehicle license pause, another significant accomplishment that um, the council and the mayor enacted last summer in what was, I think for all of us, an extremely busy summer. 
All New Yorkers are aware of the consequences of the unprecedented growth we have experienced in the high volume for hire vehicle services sector over the last several years. To address these issues and develop long-term solutions, Mayor de Blasio and the Council enacted Local Law 147 last year to establish a year-long moratorium on the issuance of new TLC for hire vehicle licenses, while also providing the TLC the critical tools necessary to develop along with our partners at the Department of Transportation, approaches to managing long-term growth and congestion, including, for the first time, giving TLC the power to establish a number of for-hire vehicle licenses and to set vehicle utilization rates for for-hire vehicles operating in the city. This study is ongoing, and the city will release its findings this summer, as well as uh, the actions that we intend to take. I also want to give you an update on accessibility, which is a key priority not only for the entire city, for the mayor, and I know for this council. Wheelchair accessible for hire transportation is vital for our city's residents and visitors, helping passengers meet friends or family, travel to work, see a movie, or visit a doctor. The TLC and the taxi industries have taken great steps to increase access to for hire service for passengers who use wheelchairs. It hasn't been easy but we've all worked extremely hard on this. Today, there are over 2,500 accessible taxis, and passengers can now hail an accessible taxi or order one through TLC's accessible dispatch program. Taxis also play a vital role in the MTA's Accessoride program. Although significant progress has been made with taxis, the city faced years of delay from the for hire vehicle sector, despite the significant growth in vehicles affiliated with the app companies which now um, account for several more vehicles and several more drivers than the taxi industry. As a result of new rules that just went into effect in January of this year, TLC now requires that all for hire vehicle bases, including the app companies, provide meaningful accessible service. To comply with the city's new accessibility rules, for hire vehicle bases may either send a specific percentage of their trips to wheelchair accessible vehicles, and that percentage increases each year, and that ensures that vehicles remain in regular circulation, or they may work with a TLC-approved accessible vehicle dispatcher to provide wheelchair accessible vehicles upon request, but within specified and monitored response times. We should all of us be proud that New York City is the first city in the United States to successfully require the high volume for hire service companies to provide accessible service. And these new accountability requirements in the for hire sector are already beginning to have impacts. Today there are over 564 accessible for hire vehicles. That is up from only 50 in 2014. I know that the council in your response to the preliminary budget identified that the mayor's management report, um, although it reports on the number of active yellow and green taxis, does not include uh, reporting on the number of active accessible for hire vehicles. That's something that we're going, we thank you for that. Um, it was, um, when we saw it, we all agreed that that was important. We're going to include that separate indicator going forward. Um, early data, it's early now, but early data does indicate that the bases are complying with the response time requirements, but TLC will continue to monitor, report, and enforce as necessary to ensure compliance Look forward to have more to say about this in the summer of this year. Um, on the issue of service refusal and discriminations, I want to update you on our push to combat illegal service refusals. Too many New Yorkers are refused service when they attempt to use for hire transportation. Over the years, TLC has enforced against service refusals and thoroughly investigated complaints. Drivers found guilty of these illegal refusals face significant fines and they ultimately face license suspension and even revocation for repeat offenses. It became very clear, however, that more was needed because this unacceptable situation has persisted. On July 31st, 2018, Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Johnson announced support for a new Office of Inclusion within the TLC whose mission is to ensure that all passengers receive the service they expect and to which they are legally entitled. Legislated, legislation creating this new Office of Inclusion was introduced by Councilmember Richards and passed into law later this year. 
We've taken this um, charge from City Council very seriously. The new office, led by Director Malcolm Kane, has assembled an interdisciplinary team working to combat illegal service refusal through driver education, data collection and analysis, community outreach, and continued prosecution. The office has met with drivers, industry groups, civil rights stakeholders, and disability advocates. Additionally, we are developing relationships with other agencies to expand existing programs and resources, and the office began passenger outreach at transportation hubs in every borough, and we've begun an extensive social marketing campaign to explain how to file complaints that will include PSAs, social media, and ads on Link NYC kiosks. We also recently um, completed a video on the topic featuring New York One's Errol Lewis, who's offered his own perspective on being on the receiving end of service refusals. I also want to make very clear that we do not consider this a problem that is only limited to the taxi industry. We know that this is also a problem in the for hire industry. This is a problem in the app industry. They, they may um, solicit and accept passengers in different ways, but discrimination can still play um, an unnecessary impact and can still have negative impacts on passengers and potential passengers. We're very pleased to provide additional updates and briefings on the work of this office, and we look forward to collaborating with the Council to make more passengers and potential passengers aware of their rights. I now want to turn to the TLC's executive budget for fiscal year 2020. The budget of $51.6 million is comprised of $39.2 million in personal services and $12.4 million in other than personal services. This executive budget is 5.7 less than the preliminary budget that TLC presented to you in March. This revision results from a reduction in the funding for TLC's green grant program to reflect the lower level of demand that we experienced. TLC has greatly enhanced the incentives available under the Green Grant Program, and we are confident that this new level of funding will meet demand. Funding for the program is now allocated through fiscal year 2023 at a level that will meet the adjusted demand for these grants. TLC's projected revenue of $61.5 million for fiscal year 2020 remains unchanged from our preliminary budget. Licensing revenue continues to be our largest source of revenue, followed by revenue from fines and vehicle inspection fees. Several factors may cause actual revenue collected to differ from the initial projection, including changes in demand for driver and vehicle licenses. We will monitor revenue during the year, and we work closely with OMB on any adjustments to the projection. Working together, Mayor de Blasio, the Council, and the TLC have achieved real benefits for drivers and passengers. Obviously, important work remains. We look forward to our ongoing partnership and we can, as we continue working for driver pay and equity, ensuring access for all passengers to, to our regulated industries, and developing long-term solutions to the many issues resulting from the unprecedented growth in the for hire vehicle sector. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I know in your testimony you began to address uh, some questions around the Green Grant Program. So let me just say that the Green Grants Program currently awards $30,000 to green taxi drivers to help them purchase vehicles that are wheelchair accessible or to ro retrofit their vehicles to become wheelchair accessible vehicles. As currently structured, eligible participants receive an upfront grant of $14,000 to help offset the cost of conversion and $4,000 annually thereafter until a $30,000 cap is reached. Due to changes in the taxi cab industry, the number of applicants to the Green Grants Program has significantly declined, as you mentioned in your testimony. In fiscal 2016, 209 grants were awarded. In fiscal 2017, 81 grants were awarded. In fiscal 2018, 12 grants were awarded. And in fiscal 2019, year to date, only seven grants have been awarded. As a result of this change in demand, DLC plans on restructuring its Green Grants Program as you mentioned, in fiscal 2020 to eliminate the $30,000 cap and allow program participants to collect $4,000 annually. The TLC currently anticipates that with this new structure, it will award 15 green grants annually beginning in fiscal 2020. That's about double of what was uh, given out last year in terms of the old program. 
So um, when can we expect to see the restructuring of the green uh, grants program? When will you be able to give us more details um, of what that will look like? Uh, it, it, it has occurred, and you actually did a great job of providing most of the details of that restructuring. Um, we have um, increased the amount of funding that is available to uh, people who purchase green grants. As you said, it's 14000 up front, and then it's 4000 a year for every year that they pass inspections and perform a minimum amount of trips. Um, Another, one other thing I want to highlight is that, that drivers in green wheelchair accessible vehicles now get, um, for the first time, they get a dollar a trip, which is equal to what um, yellow uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles drivers earn, which we also recently increased. Um, I think that I, I do want to stress, as I said in my testimony, I think that the amount that we have allocated for this with OMB is sufficient to meet the demand we have now. We're hoping that with these new incentives we'll be able to increase demand um, and we're trying to get the word out. We would love to partner with any members of the council to help us get the word out. I know that there are people who drive green wheelchair accessible vehicles who haven't signed up for the payment plan. It's very easy to sign up and then you'll receive that, that dollar a trip. So those drivers are leaving money on the table and it, it adds up, it's real money. So we're, we're trying to increase that outreach and as I said, we'd like to work with you. Um, so that's where we are. So am I correct this, in my numbers in saying that uh, only seven have um, signed up for the uh, Green Grants program this year? I think that is correct, okay. that is correct. Um, are enrollees in the Green Grant program required to drive a certain amount of hours per year before they receive the annual Four thousand dollars. They're required. They're required to do a minimum amount of trips each each year. And what's that number? I think it's two hundred fifty. Two fifty between inspections. Two fifty oh, between inspections. And they get inspected how often? I think two. T yeah, twice a year. So it's so they have to pass inspection and they have to do the two hundred fifty trips. Okay. Meanwhile, in a, a federal class action lawsuit filed in Westchester County against Lyft, mm -hmm. Lyft contends that it's not in the transportation business mm -hmm. and thus as a matter of law exempt from ADA requirements. Mm -hmm. Is the projected 15 green grant awards per year sufficient to address accessibility needs? And um, is there, what else are you doing to incentivize folks to get into that program? So, in terms of uh, the position taken by Lyft in Westchester County, that's interesting to us at that point. That's, we're well past that in New York City, and I'm proud to say that we're well past that. In addition to green wheelchair accessible vehicles and yellow wheelchair accessible vehicles, as I said, we passed our for hire vehicle accessibility rules last year. They went into effect in January. All bases are now required to provide wheelchair accessible service to their passengers and that absolutely includes Lyft, Juno, Via, and Uber. Okay, all right, thank you. Count, uh, Chair uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. A few questions. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that I feel that, you know, we are at the moment where we've been trying to do the best we can, but still I don't see that we are out of space or crisis when it comes to the taxi industry. You see that when you hear from delivery and delivery basis, you know, they are suffering every day. Many of them, they've been closing. Many of them, they've been reducing the driver from 700 to 200. Uh, and you hear how many drivers also approach with, you know, a, a level of enforcement that I'm for Vision Zero, but I feel that uh, that concern that, you, that you used to be used in the past, mm -hmm. the practice of entrapment, mm -hmm. uh, is something that also you hear from uh, members of the liberal taxis. And, and this is about what I hear from that sector is about if someone, you know, pass a red light or a stop sign, of course they should get a ticket. But to be stopped by someone that is supposed to be a senior citizen or a child and then suddenly after the taxi stop, you know, that used to be a, a, a TLC traffic enforcement agent. 
that's another story. So is that practice completely erased by TLC? So in, in terms of enforcement, um, I know that you have suggested to me that you wanted to, to meet with members of the livery community, and I just want to say again, happy to do that. G generally, in, in enforcement, um, I just want to stress that, uh, you know. I'm sorry, Bill. If you don't mind, I'm for enforcement. My of course you are, yes. So, so I know that you've been my, a part my, of the The piece too. that in, it is about practice that we hear complain, especially in the arable areas. But my specific question with that one is, and I know that in the previous commissioner, uh, I brought the issue which is about mm -hmm. the practice of entrapment. And is I that something that you can promise that, you know, have not been used anymore by TLC? I, I can tell you that one, one of the complaints that I remember was people who were, appeared to be in medical distress and said they, were, they needed to get to a hospital uh, and that was a specific concern and it was felt that that was not the best way to do it. So that has been, that has been eliminated. Okay, I, okay, that's, that I just want to know that, that practice, that's a piece that I, you know, first, and we will, I'm happy that you are, you know, in front of the TNC right now. It, and I know that we will continue, you know, finding solutions to concern and problem that, that we hear from any driver. That particular piece about entrapment me is the one that you know, one of the many things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, but again, Libre Taxi, Libre owners here are that concern about how they've been reducing their numbers. Then when you talk to the black cars, then you hear from the traditional black cars, which is we've been treated the same as, you know, no, those of us who have the bank account to provide the services, but I don't know right now, but in the previous information that we have, beside Lyft and Uber, there was an additional 73 apt company uh, registered on the TLC. That was, you know, when I used to share the committee, that was the last number. Is it still the 75 apt company that we have today, or that number has increased? Companies that, I mean, some of the traditional livery and traditional black car now use apps in their dispatch, but but the, those, the four companies that do the most business that only dispatch through app are Uber, Lyft, Juno, and Via. Okay, so can issue problem through, you know, from everywhere. Uh, yellow taxi, same thing. You know, most of those individual drivers committed suicide are, you know, yellow medallion owners. There are many of them there as individual that, you know, 6,000 individual medallion owners from the 15,000 that we have mm -hmm. in the city of New York are people who are behind the wheel and are individual that they got into the mortgage to buy the house, they got into the loan to send the kids to college. Uh, what is the hope that we have for the yellow taxi industry? No one denies that it's been very difficult for the yellow taxi industry. We've had this unprecedented industry change. I think that, that we, and by we I mean the council, the mayor, TLC, have started taking pretty significant steps toward trying to help them. One, we've done a lot of things in partnerships, often in partnership with you, to try to reduce some of the burdens on the yellow taxi industry, get rid of the owner must drive requirement, reduce the transfer tax for medallions, um, there's the incentive programs that we've had for wheelchair accessible vehicles. But from a, a larger point of view, um, I think the vehicle license cap that was put into effect last summer gave us all time to pause and to study the impact of it and to determine what type of steps we need to take going forward in terms of setting vehicle licenses. Okay. Sorry, vehicle license numbers. What, what does it take for, for going to another topic, what does it take for, for TLC to create a mental health financial advisory center to provide the services similar to the one that the Black Car Fund already started doing in the city of New York? I think 
Um, and there were two pieces of legislation. There was a driver service center and there was another piece of legislation um, requiring us to partner with Consumer Affairs on financial education. Uh, those passed, maybe not last summer, but those passed last year and the effective dates are about now, but we've already started working on them. I think um, rather than seeing TLC as providing, providing itself mental health services, I think the best use the best use for us is since we, are, we do touch so many New Yorkers and we are out there and we go to so many driver meetings, I think it's to, can you, to continue that. We do partner with Thrive, we partner with the Office of Financial Education, with small business services, we go to their resource fairs. We've done several of the, those events, we've done them either at things that we've organized that we call TLC in your borough or we've gone to uh, events organized by either other city agencies or at houses of worship where we've been traveling. I think we get out the word about the services that are available and we help connect drivers with that. I know that um, at TLC there's something called mental health uh, first aid training uh, and over 63 percent of our staff have received that and we focused on the people who have day-to-day in-person contact with drivers. That's at prosecution, licensing, external affairs. So. I think for us it's about continuing and deepening the work we're doing and, and partnering to help people get access to existing city services. Okay. I, I just would like to encourage you also for you and your team to look at, you know, what the Black Car Fund is already uh, putting, having able to put together mm -hmm. and see if there's something how, you know, we can complement or learn from uh, if that's fine with you. Absolutely, and I know that event took place earlier this week. I wasn't able to attend, but we did have TLC staff there, and we've been in, we've been in touch with them, and in fact, we've promoted um, that service. We have a newsletter called Keys to the City that we send to all of our drivers um, that gives them information about different types of city services that are available to them, and we did, we did promote that, and we um, are happy to continue discussions both with you and the Black Car Fund about those services. Okay, I, let's try to look at it because for me is that, yes, we know we passed those bill, but I would like to see specific mm -hmm. locations where, you know, as you say, those 200,000 drivers, they should know we can go to these places if we need a, a support on the mental health and also on the financial advisory area. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've been in government, so you know that sometimes we can connect people with 10, 15 places, but unless there's someone that helps to navigate the system, sometimes, you know, people get lost in the process. Yes, and we've been trying to do that not only through external affairs, but through licensing in other places where drivers come. And I can share with you a list of the different events and outreach that we've done since those bills were passed, some of which we had started before. We, that we, um, I understand your point that it, we can't just say we passed a bill and we solved the problem. We were taking it very seriously. What, what role those, how many drivers, based on a, if you have the number, if not, you can look at it like, have their car lease in order to provide the service? What percentage do you think of those numbers that you share a, or drivers that they have licensed by TSC are, has been leasing their vehicles? It's a very significant number because, partly because leasing is just the structure by which many people now get a car or, or purchase a car. We've got 85,000 drivers in the, uh, 85,000 vehicles affiliated with the four app companies. So a strong majority of those would be leased vehicles. I can get you, I can get you more numbers because the Obviously, the leasing situations differ. We don't always have that insight into um, okay. the terms of the leases or what type of leases they are. There are some of the companies, you know, own large blocks of vehicles, which they then lease out. Some some people just do one-off leases with with uh, leasing companies. Okay. How many? And yeah, that information is important. If you can mm -hmm. share with us on those numbers, that percent. How many taxi medallions have been foreclosed? on this year? I, I know that in, the, in this fiscal year there have been 322 medallion transfers. I'm not sure right now what percentage of those are a result of 
foreclosures rather than other types of transfers, but I'll get back to you with that. Okay. We know, I mean, the, there are, I know the number is high. Okay. When was the last time or the last year where the city advertised, you know, the mm -hmm. cello medallion? Uh, the last time the city... The last year, because I know for the last couple of years we don't include any projection to raise revenue by the selling of medallion. Mm -hmm. So when was the last year that the city went out advertising through different way the opportunity for people to buy yellow tax medallion? So I think the last, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question, but first I'm, I think the last, it was last year that OMB deferred projected revenue from any kind of medallion auction from the budget. Prior to that, the last city auctions of medallions began in 2013. That series um, had largely ended by early 2014. I think February was the last auction. Yeah. The city has not auctioned any medallions since February of 2014. So don't you think that the city already knew by that time that the value medallion was going down? Uh, I'm not exactly, I'm, I don't think, I, I don't really know what the city knew at that time, but um, in earlier auctions, the medallion prices were quite high, so I don't, it was pr probably reasonable to assume that the, the, the medallion value was still quite high. Okay, I, my kind of like, going, going back to the chair of finance and my colleague has question, I just want to again go back to say, well, I have one more question, but Beside that last question that we ask, I just hope that we, first of all, we need to be there for all sector. We need to do better. Mm -hmm. And I trust it led by you, but if by the time that you will be serving, you know, your role in whatever role you continue playing, right. we have to seed with all the sectors. We need to be sure. We need to work harder to, you know, lift up a black car, yellow, a four higher vehicles and see how everyone is able to do better. No, it's a big responsibility. I know that the industry has changed and I don't think that the successful of one industry should be by other suffering going down, which is that we have seen in the city of New York. So hopefully we will continue working together with you and all the stakeholders. But my last question is on, based on the budget for TLC in the last, in the last budget, on the what percentage or what opportunity did TLC create for women and minority? Uh, I'm gonna let, we have a, we've done well, I'm gonna let Jenny answer that question. So I'm, I'm sure you know that the target is 30% of contracting. Uh, at the end of December 2018, TLC's MWBE utilization rate was 48%. And uh, so in, in this fiscal year, we're confident we are going to uh, significantly exceed the target, and uh, we anticipate being able to meet or exceed the target next year as well. Can you mention some of the most important projects that were opportunity was given for women and minority? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let Vincent Chin speak to the details on the contracts. Yeah, I mean, most of our purchasing towards MWBEs is for electronics and equipment. Um, we're very small um, budget, as, okay. as you know, and so we do a lot of micro purchases and we direct as many as we can to MWBEs. Okay, I saw that my, you know, this is something big for us, and we know that sometimes we in a city like information is key, and as much as we can collaborate to spread those information, the most opportunity we create to more players in the city of New York, at least for them to know, you know, when IFP are open, you know, more information, education, or opportunity on how they should be prepared. Because also that's, you know, I have issue on how the women and minority uh, numbers, uh, and it's not just TLC in our mm -hmm. city. It, we have seen growing, but then I don't see faces. You know, it's about, a, a, I don't know, it would be good to know the faces, not just TLC, but citywide on how, who are those players on the women minority. So whatever we can continue, okay. you know, collaborating at least to spread those information will be very important. 
Absolutely. Thanks. And Chair Rodriguez, if you'll just indulge me on the medallion question. And in terms of the city's role, I do always like to, you know, look broadly. And there were significant players in the medallion transactions. There were banks, there were credit unions, they offered loans, they continued to offer loans in the face of changing markets, they continued to very aggressively influence people to refinance those loans, often against what seemed to be in their best interest. So I, I think it's, it's important as we go forward, as we focus on what we can do for medallion and assessing medallion value that we remember um, we have a big problem with the financial institutions that were involved with this, and they have a role, I think, in any ultimate solution in trying to right-size some of those loans. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have questions from, oh, we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal, Menchaca, and Moya, and now we have a question from Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair. Welcome, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, Good afternoon. I just want to ask, I want to better understand what's going on with the Accessoride pi pilot program. Mm -hmm. So um, as you know, the Accessoride program is run by the MTA, but what has been a, a development that we think has been very positive for our licensees is that they've begun to incorporate uh, yellow and green taxis. Um, and that's benefited our drivers and the vehicle owners, obviously, and it's also benefited the passengers who can get faster service, better service, more personalized service. Uh, I think we all know that the alternative was is not um, great if you're getting an, if you're getting an accessoride trip. Um, they they created the pilot with 1,200 people for on demand. They announced in April that they were extending that pilot through the end of this year, so that continues, but it continues at that um, number of 1,200 participants. Um, we have conversations with them. We have told them our views on what we think of the success of that and of the, the benefits of using our vehicles. Um, They've shifted, uh, a shift that they've done that they've recently announced is an enhanced brokerage system, and there the uh, passengers request accessible transportation. The brokerage then makes a determination, is that, best, is that trip best served in a yellow or green taxi that's accessible, or maybe in, in one of the other um, licensed vehicles at their disposal. Um, we don't control those choices. We don't control those contracts. So what we do is, you know, we meet with them on a regular basis, we advocate, we've been um, talking to some of our drivers to better understand their experience, not just the passengers, but the drivers themselves, what experience they have in terms of when they're notified of possible trips, how it's made available. So we've been talking through that and that's information then that we try to share with the MTA in an effort to make this better so that more passengers are served and also that more of our drivers are utilized. These uh, accessory trips are extremely crucial for several of our drivers. Yeah, it's a real win. I mean, we're at an, a point in time where this could be a real win-win for the taxi drivers, the medallion taxi drivers in particular. Um, has the MTA said what will happen after December? MTA has not told, has not said anything to me that they haven't said publicly. They've said it will go on until the end of the year and then and they'll, they're reevaluating. I'm sorry, what the last sentence? They're evaluating their next steps, but I haven't heard anything in addition to that. I'd um, be happy to, you know, and obviously we're always happy to meet with you and talk about ways in which mm -hmm. we can improve that access through Accessoride or through our Accessible Dispatch program. Mm -hmm. Do city funds go into the taxi program? May I just have another minute, Chair? Yes. Thank you. I, I believe. Or is that MTA meaning, funds? I'm sorry, meaning into the Accessoride program? Into the taxi, the pilot. I don't think so specifically. There, are, there may be some city contribution to the overall accessoride budget, but it's not a specific line item or something the city pays for. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, so what I've heard from my colleagues um, in the disability community 
is that, um, first of all, it was their understanding that the program currently was cut in half. So it sounds like that's misinformation. I'm happy to take that back. I, 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 I don't mean to interrupt you. I think that around the enhanced brokerage system, I think it was, it was initially it was somewhat confusing what the re, what the impact and the result of that was. But I have to separate that from the pilot. The pilot had 1,200 participants and continues to have 1,200 participants. Okay. Um, so what I'm hearing is that with the brokerage system, they might be spreading around the who gets called, not just taxi drivers, medallion taxi drivers, but also now possibly Uber, Lyft, other black car services, right? I, I don't think Uber and Lyft aren't participants. Vincent, do you wanna? No, it's um, as far as the brokerage that we were talking about, it's just for the yellow and green taxi drivers. Oh, so there's no other black car service that's, the brokerage service is just for yellow and green. Um, there are um, two other bases that um, are TLC licensed and they're black cars, but I, I don't believe, they're, they're not dispatched through Uber or Lyft. Gotcha. There will be other okay. like, livery um, companies. That's helpful clarification. I mean, all I would say is the feedback I'm getting about the pilot is that it's indispensable the people who were lucky enough to be in the pilot say that it's changed their lives. And, um, you know, of course, I would hope um, that that could be a service available to all um, New Yorkers with disabilities. Um, and I'm sorry to hear the MTA hasn't even guaranteed it past the end of the year. Um, and certainly would like to be helpful in any way I can. Um, and I'm open, you know, please let me know how I could be helpful and I'm confident that my there are colleagues here who would join that effort to be helpful in getting the MTA to expand that for anyone with a disability. The Accessoride program is a failure um, and does not, you know, I think in many ways causes more aggravation uh, than anything else. So this pilot has been very successful and whatever we can do to encourage its continuation, I think um, we're on board to do. Thank you, or go ahead. Thank you, and I've heard some of the same feedback from people that, that we work with, that it is an indispensable service. And, and I just wanna point out, I think we have entered into a phase where we have a really good partnership with the MTA. We're in constant communication with them, and we're working. Um, when I said I don't know what they're doing next with the pilot, that's because I don't know what they're doing next with the pilot. I think that's an internal decision and discussion they have to have. Uh, but we're you know, committed to making the partnership work through whatever means that is, including through the enhanced brokerage. And it really does mean a lot of trips for the drivers who we license. So we think it's very positive and has a lot of potential to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, as you know, a few days ago, I think last, last week and a few days ago, a, a driver was assaulted in the Bronx. Uh, what percentage of, of vehicles today they are who are required have installed a camera and how do you think what much more can be done to improve safety for drivers um, I think a few things can be done to improve safety for drivers I'm sorry I don't have that specific that's a question I should have the answer to and I don't and I can get you the answer to that there is, specifically you would want to know the number of cars that have uh, in vehicle camera systems we, we know like I know that on the in in numbers of vehicles, especially in the four Ohio vehicle, mm -hmm. they based in previous initiative and law that we have passed at the council, they have come right for the safety of the of the driver. Is that something that is mandated today for all four Ohio vehicle to have camera, including the green taxi? It's not mandated in all vehicles. In taxis, you can have a camera or you can have a partition. In um, livery and in black car, I know that in black car, you if you have a camera, you have to notify 
Um, you have to notify the uh, passenger that there is a camera and livery. I don't remember right now what the specific requirement for camera is for livery, but I, I know that many of them have the camera. Okay. I think that, you know, looking for the safety of and see how is the industry doing, especially those drivers? It's a challenge. As you know, it's a challenge specific to livery because the, it's livery still does a mostly cash business. Okay. And, and, and I would like to end saying that as I will always stand for all the drivers, it is also unacceptable for any drivers. And I know that it, we have a bad apple everywhere. We have in the government, we have in the private, we have in the academic sector, everywhere. And I don't feel that the few bad apple reflect the majority. I believe that again, that most taxi drivers, they, great, they do a great job. They Absolutely. pick up the, the passenger and they take the passenger to whatever destination they're going. But they practice, you know, that is still those few get involved, which is to refusing to take any passenger because mm -hmm. how the passenger look like mm -hmm. is something that you know even reported from the New York Times and other been going through in that experience. And I think that you know the message should be that as we will stand for all the drivers, uh, that practice that was very common in the past it still continues today. It is unacceptable as someone. Uh, is not able to get a taxi because the color of the skin on how or how that individual look like. So hopefully we will continue working together to eradicate that practice. But um, also at the same time, we need to continue working together to, to level the playing field so that all drivers also, they get all the support that they need from us. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, and with that, we're going to end here, and I thank you for coming in and giving testimony and, uh, and your whole team. Thank you again. Thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna take a five-minute break, and then we will uh, come back with the uh, Department of Transportation.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Transportation, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. We just heard from the Taxi and Limousine Commission, and now we will hear from Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Commissioner. First of all, thank you for being a partner in Meninicity, Vision Zero, and, and your team for also being a partner with our Car Free Day. Be ready for the 2020. So we will be knocking your door very soon so that we can start planning to do the fifth Car Free Day uh, bigger than the previous four that we had done. As I said before, the budget for fiscal 2020 is approximately a 1.9 billion, a 4.2 percentage increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. The increase is associated with various new needs, including the addition of 300 new school zones, speed cameras, and the addition of new traffic enforcement agents to combat black card abuse. The committee looks forward to hearing updates on these important transportation initiatives. In addition, DOT's 10-year capital strategy is $16.1 billion for fiscal year 2020-2029, of which $9.4 billion is budgeted in fiscal years 2020-2023. We hope the department will discuss its goals and prioritize for the next four years, as well as the scope and progression of work for Vision Zero project and the reconstruction of the BQE County labor. I also would like it as we will have this conversation with the commissioners today to talk about the need to increase funding for DOT so that they can redesign all danger intersection before the end of this administration. I know that this is a common goal and I know that we can have conversation about where we are and what is our goal for the next few years. It, so with that, uh, I go back to the chair. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna ask council to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? You may proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Rodriguez and Drom and members of the Transportation and Finance Committees. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today are Elizabeth Franklin, Associate Commissioner for Budget and Capital Program Management, and Ben Smith, Director of City Legislative Affairs. We're pleased to be here on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio to testify on DOT's $1.1 billion fiscal year 20 executive expense budget and 10-year $17.9 billion FY19 to FY29 capital plan. As I said when I testified back in March, this budget will support DOT in its mission to provide for the safe, efficient, and environmentally sustainable movement of people and goods in New York City. At that hearing, I reviewed many of our 2018 accomplishments and highlighted some of our top priorities for 2019. Today, I'll provide updates on a few of those priorities and some key additions and changes in our executive budget. Before I discuss these topics, you can see an overview of our entire budget in my written testimony. Starting with Vision Zero. As many of you know, Northern Boulevard in recent years has seen a high number of tragic deaths. So I'm glad to say that with an initial commitment by Mayor de Blasio of nearly $80 million in capital funds, we'll be adding Northern Boulevard to our Great Streets program. Great Streets has successfully targeted those corridors with the highest rates of pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries per mile. These wide roads divide our neighborhoods and communities, but with targeted attention in the Vision Zero era, have shown the potential to serve as connectors. Through Great Streets, we think Northern Boulevard can be redesigned to prevent serious crashes, enhance mobility, increase accessibility, and enhance neighborhood vitality. We began the Great Streets program in 2015 with an initial $250 million investment that has now grown to nearely $575 million, focused on four <coughs> quarters, Queens Boulevard, the Grand Concourse, and Fourth Avenue and Atlantic Avenues in Brooklyn. 
The crash and injury declines along these four streets have been dramatic and encouraging. For the next phase of the program, we analyzed crash data, and after the recent increase in pedestrian fatalities on Northern Boulevard, DOT held three neighborhood workshops last fall. As a result of what we heard, we'll be putting in safety improvement projects in 2019, 2020, and 2021, followed by a major capital project, using everything in our Vision Zero toolkit to reverse the trend of fatalities we've seen on this challenging arterial. With a combination of existing funding and new funding proposed in this budget, we'll also begin design this year on a number of other exciting Vision Zero Street reconstruction projects or add enhancement to an existing Broadway project, from Broadway and Manhattan to Astoria Boulevard in Queens, Southern Boulevard in the Bronx, the intersection of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, and Travis Avenue in Staten Island, as well as several, several others you can see in my written testimony. Turning to speed cameras, which the, the chairman has mentioned, I'm glad to say, as we all know, we succeeded in achieving reauthorization and expansion of our vital life-saving program in Albany this year, and we're looking forward to the governor signing this very important legislation. We were able to accomplish this victory with the council's strong support and working together with the brave families of those who have loved lost ones to traffic crashes, safe streets advocates, and our state elected partners. New York City is now authorized through 2022 to operate speed cameras in up to 750 school zones during the expanded hours of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekends and with greater flexibility on camera placement. In this budget, DOT would have the funding and headcount to install and operate 300 additional cameras based on where the speeding and crash data tells us the safety need is greatest. We're currently working on what the full rollout will look like and we plan to have more to share soon and we'll welcome council member input. Finally, when it comes to Vision Zero, we know fatalities are up about 15% compared to this time last year, and recent tragedies underscore the urgency of our work. Expanding our speed camera program will be a key piece, and we'll continue our exponentially increased output of safety projects, up over 5,000% for leading pedestrian intervals last year compared to pre-Vision Zero averages, over 800% for corridor retimings, more than double for safety improvement projects and protected bike lanes, and nearly double for speed reducers. We will be guided by our new borough pedestrian safety action plans in which we use the freshest available data showing us that just 7% of the city streets are responsible for nearly half of all pedestrian fatalities. Next in this budget, the mayor proposes to fund his commitment to strengthen placard enforcement and to take the first steps towards a digital parking management system that replaces physical placards by 2021 as DOT COO Margaret Forgione testified about back in March. First, we will use $850,000 a year proposed in this budget to hire a new 10-person DOT placard fraud and abuse enforcement team to supplement NYPD's ongoing efforts. With this new team, we'll initially focus on Lower Manhattan given the prevalence of agencies in placard use in this area and long-standing community complaints. As we undertake this initiative, we'll evaluate its effectiveness and look into potential next steps, including focusing on other placard abuse hotspots. Second, we'll use the funds proposed in this budget, including $39.7 million in new capital funding and $3.7 million in the expense budget, to upgrade our 14,500 existing parking meters with pay-by-license plate technology. We'll implement this conversion in order to roll out a state-of-the-art parking management system with NYPD that will allow more effective enforcement and be less susceptible to abuse. Through this integrated system, we will link parking meters, park NYC payments, and placard information with license plates, and make the information available to NYPD handheld enforcement devices in real time. Once the system is fully implemented, enforcement agents will use this information to automatically verify vehicles as legally or illegally parked without referring to what may or may not be displayed on a vehicle's dashboard. This can eliminate confusion in enforcement and thwart attempts to falsify or misuse muni meter receipts and placards. Let me now turn to mobility, starting first with the biggest news on this front since the last time I testified. As you know, the state recently authorized congestion pricing for the Manhattan Central Business District, in line with the mayor and the governor's 10-point plan to transform and fund the MTA. DOT is working very closely with MTA Bridges and Tunnels, which will build and manage the congestion pricing system. As part of this partnership, the city is negotiating a memorandum of understanding with MTA Bridges and Tunnels that will govern the use of our streets, bridges, and other infrastructure, as well as reimbursement of the city's costs related to congestion pricing. DOT will review the designs for the system, and we're asking the MTA to abide by our permit rules so that all the work is done safely and in a coordinated manner with sensitivity to community concerns. So far, the collaboration between the city and the MTA is going very well. 
and I want to thank MTE Chair and CEO Pat Foy and his team for fully engaging the city in the planning for this historic project. The city will also have a role in discussions around tolling policy. The mayor will propose a member of the Six-Person Traffic Mobility Review Board, the new entity that will recommend toll rates and policies in the fall of 2020. To support the work of this new board, DOT and MCA Bridges and Tunnels will conduct a joint traffic study to evaluate the impact of different tolling scenarios. We also plan to collaborate with the MTA on the evaluation of congestion pricing, looking at the program's impact on congestion, transit use, air quality, and demand for the curb. DOT will also be evaluating parking impacts in local neighborhoods. Finally, as part of our partnership with New York City Transit, we will be looking at ways to improve transit options from the boroughs into the central business district so that all New Yorkers have alternatives to driving. Next, as you know, the mayor recently announced our Better Buses Plan to improve bus speeds by 25%. On 14th Street in particular, we were excited back in January to announce that DOT and New York City Transit would implement select bus service this year, the 17th route to get the service. The M14 currently carries 27,000 daily riders and provides a critical connection from the Lower East Side to Union Square and the Meatpacking District. And last month, the mayor announced that we would implement faster, more reliable service for the new M14 SBS through a transit and truck priority pilot on this corridor. As the mayor said, we have an opportunity to try something new and better serve bus, bus riders on one of Manhattan's busiest crosstown streets. In case you've not how, heard how it will work, a quick primer on how transit truck priority, or what we're calling TTP, will complement SBS service. Starting later this spring, only buses, trucks, and emergency vehicles will be able to use 14th Street between 3rd and 9th Avenues as a through route. Local traffic will be permitted to make pickups and drop-offs along the corridor and access garages, but cars will always need to turn right at the next possible location and left turns will not be allowed. DOT will implement new curbside regulations that prioritize short-term loading and passenger pickup activity. We will redesign intersections along 14th Street with new turn lanes where appropriate to ensure that bus lanes will remain clear. And we will also enhance Vision Zero treatments at that intersections, including painted curb extensions that increase pedestrian safety. Our team, worked closely, uh, our team had closely studied international best practices for busy transit corridors and had discovered that King Street in Toronto, a major streetcar route, had faced similar traffic challenges. Just two years ago, Toronto piloted new regulations that prioritized transit and pedestrian uses along the street. The city found that under the pilot, mass transit travel times were dramatically reduced and ridership increased. And just a month ago, Toronto City Council voted overwhelmingly, 22 to 3, to make the once controversial changes to King Street permanent. The new TTP pilot design builds on this model as well as proposals we had made during the original L train planning process but also incorporates key feedback from local residents and businesses to ensure that curb access remains available and that through truck traffic will not be diverted to adjacent streets. In the weeks ahead, DOT will conduct further outreach to stakeholders, including the five different community boards served by 14th Street and educational campaigns for the people who use the corridor. As we continue to address congestion across New York City, we hope this experiment implemented by June will provide us with another tool to move buses faster and more reliably. We will also pursue making permanent the nearly three miles of new protected bike lanes we installed last year along 12th and 13th streets. Since we installed the lanes last fall, cyclist usage has grown dramatically. We've made these new lanes part of our crosstown protected bike lane strategy in Manhattan, along with recently installed lanes on 26th and 29th streets and a planned pair along 52nd and 55th streets. We'll also pursue making the bike lanes along Grand Street and Brooklyn permanent while making sure that the design works on the industrial end of the corridor. City bike expansion is underway with 20 new stations installed in East Williamsburg and Bushwick over the past month and an additional 90 to be installed along the L train corridor in Brooklyn and Queens this summer. And we hope to have an update for the council soon about the contours of lifts for their expansion of city bike to ultimately double the size of the service area and triple the size of the fleet. On April 22nd, we announced a request for expressions of interest or an RFEI that could bring borough-wide dockless bike share to Staten Island this summer. In the current pilot that launched last year, we learned that Staten Islanders love bike share, but we found that their rides often ended up outside the pilot's North Shore boundaries. So now riders have voted with their feet and we want the entire island to be available to them by bike. We hope that multiple vendors will participate, but I do wanna note that the bike share industry continues to be in a state of flux. The experience from our initial docklet, dockless pilot is instructive. 
Of the 12 companies that initially expressed interest, half could not meet our minimum requirements to participate. Of the four serious entrants that made it to launch, only two, Lime and Jump, are still operating robust pilot services today. Companies with multi-billion dollar valuations in late 2017, such as Ofo and Mobike, withdrew completely from North America and are struggling to stay afloat, even in their original Chinese markets. As with our current pilot, we would evaluate this larger demonstration by looking at usage, rider satisfaction, safety, sidewalk obstruction and clutter, availability and durability of the bikes, and compliance with data accessibility, privacy, and user protections. And while dockless bike share has the great potential to be a travel option in Staten Island, we also think it has helped contribute to Vision Zero, as last year with hundreds of brightly colored lime and jump bikes on the streets, it was the safest year ever in the borough for cyclists and everyone else. Finally, we'll be continuing our current dockless pilots in the Rockaways in the Fordham section of the Bronx, at least through Labor Day, and I'm happy to say that Lime will be adding about 200 additional bikes in the Rockaways, and we're exploring similar possibilities in the Bronx. Turning to maintaining our vital transportation infrastructure in the FY19 to 29 capital budget, the mayor commits historic investments with a focus on both Vision Zero and maintaining a state of good repair. This budget adds an additional 309 million for street reconstruction, which includes Northern Boulevard and other Vision Zero projects I mentioned earlier, as well as South Bronx SBS, an additional 191 million for vital bridge repairs, and an additional 125 million for roadway resurfacing. As I said in my preliminary budget testimony, in FY18, DOT committed a record 2.2 billion worth of bridge street and ferry capital projects. And with improved planning and scoping, I'm proud to say we achieved a capital commitment rate of 81%, up from 42% at the start of this administration. We remain laser focused on project delivery and are happy to continue working with the council to explore ways that the administration and the city can improve the capital process. And of course, when it comes to the state of good repair and project delivery, no DOT project is big, bigger or more complex than the BQE. Last month, the city announced an expert panel chaired by New York Building Congress President Carlos Cesura that is taking a comprehensive look at the project, including underlying assumptions and the various proposals put forward. Further, the panel will look at policy considerations, including governance models, and how we can best ensure all the necessary stakeholders are at the table for this critical effort. The panel's held five meetings so far, beginning with a deep dive on the project background, followed by a tour of the structure and the surrounding area. This tour included representatives from a number of agencies that spoke about their adjacent facilities, including multiple New York City transit substations and fan plants that are critical to the four subway lines that run underneath, DEP's 10-foot sewer main under Furman Street, as well as some of Brooklyn Bridge Park engineering. The panel will also be taking a significant look at the economic impacts of the BQE as a freight corridor and traffic assumptions and modeling, particularly in light of the progress on congestion pricing and recent momentum behind reinstating two-way tolling on the Verrazano Bridge. Community and elected official engagement is also a critical part of the panel's process. The chair has met with a number of elected officials and community stakeholders, and the panel as a whole recently held a large meeting with many civic and community organizations in the project area. We were joined by City Council Land Use Director, staff of the Office of Council Member Levin, State Senator Brian Cavanaugh, and Assembly Member Joanne Simon, and staff from Borough President Adams' office. We're aware that the Council has issued an RFP to retain an independent consultant to take a look at the project as well. We look forward to working with this consulting team and continuing our work with the Council. Finally, we heard in the Mayor's budget address that the City continues to face tough choices as a result of state cost shifts for social service, education, and health programs, in addition to continued fiscal uncertainty in Washington. While making the vital investments I've discussed, this budget also includes savings of $16.0 million in fiscal year 19 and $14.1 million in fiscal year 20. We were able to accomplish this through initiatives that reached our city-funded costs and recognized increased revenues without impacting important public services. And you can see the details of some of those in my written testimony. In conclusion, in the sixth year of the de Blasio administration, I'm proud of the world-class work DOT has done on Vision Zero, improving our transportation infrastructure, and embracing new technologies. Looking ahead, we'll be tackling the ambitious new executives from 14th Street Truck and Transit Priority Pilot to the expansion of our speed camera program, while implementing our Better Buses Plan, dramatically expanding City Bike, and continuing our aggressive pace of bike lane installation while tackling a new set of Vision Zero priority locations. And cities all around the country will be looking to see how we and the MTA together implement congestion pricing here in New York City. I want to thank the Council for its continued partnership, and I'm now happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner, uh, and I appreciate you coming in to give testimony. 
We've been joined by Council Members Levine, Cabrera, Miller, Espinal, and Cumbo, and we will have questions from some of them later. But let me start off, and um, I hate to start off on a negative note, but I am very, very, very upset with the Department of Transportation. Um, you know, I've been working on a project in my district for over 10 years, um, and that project is the Travis Park project and the 78th Street Play Street. Uh, we uh, permanently closed 78th Street. We purchased land from the private school uh, that um, is on 78th Street. Um, we provided um, about $13 million in funding for this project, mostly from council funding, some from uh, the borough president and a little bit from the mayor as well, previous administration. Um, and about three and a half months ago, I found out that the plans, uh, which we also had visioning sessions with the community, four visioning sessions where people from the community came in and um, you know, sat with DOT, hundreds and hundreds of people, probably one of the biggest visioning sessions that you've had, and together as a community with the department and with the Department of Parks, uh, decided what the, um, uh, that park renovation, that plaza renovation would look like. Now, it has been said that we're going to allow cars onto that plaza or to that park. And that is just totally unacceptable. Uh, and what is really concerning to me is that um, I was not informed of this until after two months when um, the business who's using the auto dealership, the Coppell auto dealership, that's using the closed off street um, for his own purposes to get into his garage and also for s service work, he's doing service work in the, in the, in the plaza, okay? And, and also parents from the neighboring garden school are using it and driving through it because uh, they're picking up kids and dropping off kids. Um, and that now you and the Department of Parks have agreed to redesign the plaza. Now, I've never heard of a plaza or even a park being redesigned when it's in the middle of a project. And the, 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 the major point of contention here is that Coppell wants to continue to use his curb cut and his, what he believes is his own private driveway for cars to get into his dealership. So what I wanna know is um, who um, did, um, who did Coppell reach out to? How did, how did the meeting with Coppell round about November or December occur? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and obviously, I want to say up front, we, you know, we're very sorry for the situation and understand your frustration. And I, I can assure you this is, you know, something that is being tried to work out at the highest levels, law department, city hall, DOT, Parks and Department of Buildings. I'll, I'll give you the chronology as best as I understand it, while admitting that I, you know, only sort of became aware of the, the, the controversy and the problems that were occurring sort of later this year. But, you know, my understanding, the history here is, the plaza was designed with one property owner that, you know, had made it clear they had no interest in using that curb cut, which is a legal curb cut to the building. And then, in the middle of last year, unfortunately, the property changed hands. The new owner, Howard Capel, came in and started a process, it's I guess. It's actually the same property owner. It's a trust, but it's just a different dealership. It was a different, different dealership. Different, and or a different, different sort of person on the ground of the building. And I guess, and again, I don't know Mr. Capel. I've never met him, but I guess he started doing a re, you know, a, a sort of a rehab of the building and changing the orientation of how his operations were going to work. My understanding, and I think you'll need Parks Department to confirm this, is Sometimes towards the end of last year, he reached out to people in parks, I don't know who, apologize, and I think his plans were not totally formalized at that time, but started to talk to them. They pulled in, us in at some point, and I, I apologize if you feel like there was a period of radio silence. I don't think it was intentional. I think it sounds like all parties were trying to see if they could come to a solution that would have a good outcome. Obviously, they but failed. A, a good solution without involving the council member or the community. Well, again, I, I, I After think... After all of that outreach was done, again, it, I, I think it's there was, unbelievable. I think there was potentially a hope that they could come back with something that, the, that you and the community would like. Obviously, that did not happen Without here. community input. After, after we did four visioning sessions, 
and people know how active and involved that community is, how that community and the Jackson Heights Green Alliance has worked with the Department of Transportation to do the street closures in the first place, they were totally ignored. Well, I guess I think my, my understanding is a little different than yours, and I'm, I'm sorry if I feel that way. I think there was a period where the city was trying to negotiate with Mr. Capel. I think when they sensed that that wasn't favorable, they came back to you and to the advocates. And we're keenly aware, believe me, of how they went unhappy to the advocates. Commissioner, they went to Coppell first. Okay, they did not go to the community, they did not go to me, they did not tell me until two and a half months after meeting with Coppell. It was in fact Coppell who first informed me that the Department of Transportation and the Parks Department had decided to redesign the plaza and the park. Yeah, I, again, So I can't I, get to the bottom of this. This is why I'm putting you on the record and you are under oath. Right, and again, I'm, I'm giving you the version as I know it, which is Mr. Coppell reached out to the Parks Department first Parks Department then communicated. So are there any other examples of businesses that get to redesign parks? Well, I think this is a strange case in that we have a lot of plazas in which there are curb cuts. Commissioner, are there, there any other examples of businesses who get to redesign parks and or plazas? Well, I guess I would say probably in the case of a lot of parks and plazas, we've made changes to the designs due to all kinds of community feedback, public and private. This one- After it's been designed? Yeah, I mean, we make changes to our like plaza where? designs. Um, I don't have to, have, someone will have to give me a list of some of those. This admittedly is a very unique case. I, I don't, I've worked on dozens of plazas. I've never known of one that's had exactly the circumstance. We do have plazas that have curb cuts this is an unusual one in that I think we all thought the curb cut was dormant, and obviously when a new building manager came in, they brought the curb cut back to life. That is a situation I have never seen before. Usually if they're live curb cuts, we design the plazas to accommodate them. So this is one, at least it's, it's unique in my experience. Well, it, it's, it's um, very interesting because the garden school's curb cuts were taken away. Um, and the, 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 the Coppell uh, was originally taken away in the design, and, uh, and now all of a sudden he's being given access to curb cuts after the design has been completed. I don't for the life of me understand it. Do you know, Commissioner, that on Northern Boulevard, over the last three years, I have had six children killed within the vicinity of this plaza and park? I mean, look, I am obviously very aware of all the fatalities on Northern Boulevard. Kids. And, and, and that okay, is why Okay, and this, you're talking about putting cars into a park. That is why in this budget, as okay, I just and mentioned. That, do you, is that part of Vision Zero? It's not part of Vision Zero, but again, I think we have just a legal do matter to- cars and kids to, mix? It's a legal matter to wrangle with here. Mr. Capel has chosen to exercise his legal right to use that curb cut, as I've said. And you and you have complied with him. Well, not yet. As I said, I think every part of city government. No, is right now to that is a closed street, and you are allowing him to use the closed street for his own purposes, and you have you have accommodated him at his request without even informing the council member. Okay. I mean, how much worse can this get? Well, I guess I. I sort of have a different understanding of it. I'm sorry if you view so it that way. If you I haven't think even been informed by the Queensboro Commissioner about what the situation is, that speaks volumes to what's going on in the Queen's office. I would suggest that you look into it. Okay, I really would. Okay. I mean, I am, I am not going to give up on this. All right. And what the city should do here is go forward with the original plans and uh, let him sue. Okay, let him sue. Okay, because this involves children's lives. And I'm tired of hearing the nonsense it took us years to fight to get the money for Northern Boulevard, to get the redesign in Northern Boulevard. I haven't even been fully informed about what that design in Northern Boulevard is gonna look like. I understand some islands are gonna be put in, maybe some LPIs are gonna be put in, but I haven't been informed of that. And this is after I've tried to work with your, with your agency. Let me go on. Um, on April 6, 2019, the New York City Wireless Network, or NiceWin, a $500 million network malfunctioned and shut down for 10 days due to a long-anticipated and forewarned Y2K-like bug. The shutdown interrupted DOT's ability to program traffic lights, including 12,389 traffic signal controllers that went down on the first day. 
According to the New York Times, a city official who asked not to be named said that there was concern that the traffic signals remained disconnected and the timing of the individual signals could drift and they would eventually come out of sync with each other. NiceWin is currently being phased out by Do It and DOT and has hired a private vendor to install an administrative replacement system, Transnet, at a cost of $75 million. Due to a delay in ongoing negotiations with potential vendors, the preliminary budget included a savings of $8.7 million in fiscal 19 and an executive budget included an additional savings of $1 million in 2019. Can you please update the council on the effect of, nice, of the nice wind shutdown on DOT? Yeah, I'm happy to say that the, the effects on our traffic signal were very minimal. The, the DOT traffic signal is very robust and has a lot of redundancy built into it. So when the nice wind system went down, the nice wind sort of controls some of the higher level algorithms that we use for things like Midtown and Motion. And I'm happy to say that during the course of the week, as we got nice wind up and running again, we did not see any significant impacts and, and no reports from the public that they saw anything happening on the ground with the traffic signals. When does DOT expect to select a carrier for Transnet so that the agency is not reliant upon nice wind? That I, I believe that selection is happening within this month, even perhaps within this week. And then I think a bunch of the city agencies will be phasing out of nice wind by the end of the year. It's going to take longer for DOT because we're the biggest nice wind customer and we want to make sure we have a good transition. Our full transition out of NICEWIN will probably be sometime into the third quarter of 2020. Do you think that this is a problem that could have been avoided? I mean, I think it's a problem that could have been avoided. I would also say it was a, it was a bit of a, a strange one-off circumstance. It was kind of an obscure technical matter that the NICEWIN system was using GPS for its clock purposes, as far as I understand, and that the nice wind system is a very old one. It was put together right after 9-11. Again, I'm happy to say I think the impacts on the ground, at least particularly from DOT's point of view, were imperceptible. Okay. Uh, during Speaker Johnson's State of the City speech, the Speaker pointed out that the Lexington Avenue subway line carries more passengers uh, than the BQE in a morning rush hour, and that the city should study alternatives, including the removal of the BQE in its entirety. Currently, over $1.5 billion has been committed to rehabilitation of the BQE. The current plan that is funded in the budget is for a six-lane highway to replace the promenade for a six-year period. However, during the preliminary budget hearing, DOT said that they were evaluating alternatives and looking to bring in a broader set of experts to look at the project. Has DOT studied the alternatives, including the possibility of removing the BQE in its entirety? And if so, what would removing the BQE mean? And look, I think, I think it is, it's safe to say it is, it is one of the biggest and most high profile and challenging projects. And as I said in my testimony, I think we at DOT decided we, we needed a, a broader set of experts to look through the, the different proposals. There are many on the table, including the speakers and the comptrollers and a number of other proposals put forward. So the mayor has created a, a, what we're calling a panel of experts, independent people from all different disciplines, engineers, planners, parks experts, chaired by Carlos Sassura, who, who runs the, the New York Building Congress. The panel is immersing itself in the details and complexities of the site, of the project needs, and is doing an evaluation of each of the different options that are on the table. It is going to take a look at the sort of complete removal of the BQE. Just to toss out there a couple challenges with that option. The BQE is the major north-south highway in New York City. It carries 140,000 vehicles a day. It is the major freight route for the entire city connecting the airports and the ports with a bunch of freight distribution centers. And you know, one challenge is it's a six-lane highway running throughout from the Verrazano Bridge all through Brooklyn and Queens. If you remove one section of it, obviously the traffic is going to filter out into the other parts of the city. But again, the panel has been tasked with looking at all possible proposals and, and keeping an open mind on anything that might be viable. Okay, thank you. Over the last three years, DOT has met or exceeded its goal of repaving 1,300 lane miles of streets annually. However, the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget included only $135 million in fiscal 2020 compared to $298 million in the current fiscal year for in-house baseline funding for street resurfacing. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, and street repaving and resurfacing. The council called on the administration to increase the baseline funding for street resurfacing by 163 million in the fiscal 2020 executive budget. 
Overall, the DOT's capital budget for street resurfacing increased by just $127.8 million in the executive budget for a total of $262.8 million, enough to repave only 1,100 lane miles. How will DOT meet its goal of repaving 1,300 lane miles annually if it is not adequately funded? So I think some of you are aware when, when this administration came in, the city had been, I think, under investing in street resurfacing and for a period about 10 years prior had typically not even resurfaced up to 1,000 lane miles. So when we came in, we felt that the streets were in poor condition and the mayor working with the council really increased DOT's funding and we started paving 1,300 lane miles. We did that for three years and almost a fourth. I think at this point we've seen an improvement in roadway conditions and we've asked the question, what's the sustainable level? What should the city be doing every year? And there is sort of one new challenge to our resurfacing as part of the settlement the city has entered into with the disability groups on making sure our sidewalks and curbs are accessible. Anytime the city does resurfacing now, it has to upgrade all the curbs and make them fully ADA accessible. So the, I think the city thinks the 1,100 <laughs> miles is now the, the number we want to hit every year. It'll enable us to hold on to the gains we've made in resurfacing and keep a pace with the reconstruction of the curve. And I think the reason you're doing those um, recurving, I mean, re resurfacing of those curves is because originally there, were, there was a mistake made on that, right? I mean, it's been sort of a matter, a matter of some dispute between the cities and the federal requirements, but I think it's been clarified legally and certainly in the settlement. But ultimately, that's why you have to replace right, it. Right, right. That, 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 that resurfacing, which used to be considered just a modification, now is considered work that requires all the curb cuts adjoining it to be fully ADA compliant. Do you have any information about personal injury lawsuits or the cost to the city for not taking care of uh, some of those um, in its, uh, streets in bad shape, curbs? Uh, the, yeah, I mean, the law department and the comptroller are typically the ones who sort of handle those settlements and, and keep those numbers. It, it's, I think my understanding is, and I, I'll double check this number, I think it's the city overall in lawsuits involving streets and sidewalks, I think maybe it's around 30 million, but I, I want the team to double check. I, I don't want to stand by that number until we check it. Okay, all right. Now, just to go back to Northern Boulevard, I said I have not really been fully informed about what's going to happen there. So can you give me an update on what that's going to look like? Yeah, and no, and I'm, I'm very sorry to hear you feel like you don't have a full update. I, I want to make sure actually we, we get more details to your staff. I mean, we're planning three years of work, and I'll see if I can pull out some of the schematics. Some of the things you know, pedestrian islands, signal timing, better crossings, and then we're going to be in that process working to come up with what is ultimately going to be the design for the capital work. But Commissioner, what I'm interested in is also is where those islands and LPIs will be. Will it be from um, my district runs from 69th Street to Junction Boulevard? Will it be every corner? Will, what will, will it be, what do they call it, uh, barnstorming? Barns dance. I think we're going to do more LPIs instead of barns dances. I have a bunch of details here, but it, it might be, there's, we're doing actually a lot of work over the next few years, so it might be worth you know, sorry if you don't feel like you've had a full briefing on it. Sit down with the maps and walk you so through So will this it. be from Long Island City right through um, uh, uh, Corona? Yeah, well, I, yeah, yeah. She'll, let, let's check the. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm okay. going to turn it over to Co-Chair uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, when we look at the executive budget response, Definitely the council is not happy with what we got. Uh, we hope that by that from here to the handshake, uh, city hall, uh, look at all those areas. And as you can see in, in the executive budget response, we have been partially funded in increased plaza program install additional pedestrian signal at bus lane, resurfacing street, area that are very important for Vision Zero and to make the city more walkable. But worse than that, in the executive budget, we also was completely unfunded when it comes to install transit signal priority systems, repair NYCHA sidewalks, quadruples the number of shared streets, 
replace paving street signs and count pedestrians and cyclists. All those things are vision zero. So what is our plan? To get to the finish line with more resources to DOT so that those programs are funded. So, I mean, I, I want to say overall, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you and the council and the mayor for this. I mean, DOT is receiving, I'm going to double check, I think over a 10-year period, $2.8 billion to invest in Vision Zero. So I, look, there's always more we can do. And, and I do want to say, though, I, I think our department is grateful. We have gotten a very robust amount of resources. You know, in, in many of the, the items that you listed there, we have doubled or tripled our output. That said, I understand the council wants, wants to see more happen there, and I, I assume that will be part of the ongoing negotiation between the administration and the council. I would just say I think we feel grateful for the resources we've gotten, and we, we've tried to make the best use of them that we could. But what can we say about, you know, like install transit signal priority system is underfunding in the budget executive response. Repair NACHA sidewalks is unfunded in the executive budget response. The quadruplex or number shear street is unfunded in the executive budget response. Replace fading street signs are unfunded. Count pedestrians and, uh, pedestrian and cyclists are unfunded too. So, I mean, I think some of those items, I'll start with, you mentioned TSP. I mean, we've gotten another 2.7 million, I think, and we have now basically I think it's quadrupled the pace in which we are installing TSP. I think we found new methodologies and gotten a lot better at what we're doing. I think, you know, a number of the items you're talking about, we have a lot of resources, and, you know, it's in part up to the agency to continue to find ways to move faster and smarter on some of these items, which we're trying to do. And for sidewalks, when I, when, just to mention the side of NYCHA sidewalks, when I came into this agency, you know, we were investing a pretty small amount, only about a million dollars a year on NYCHA sidewalks. Now we're spending upwards of four million, and DOT and NYCHA are working together, coordinating on, you know, where we see the, the most need for sidewalk work. So I think in a lot of the categories you're mentioning, the administration, working with the council, has put in a lot bigger investments, but I understand there's, there's certainly more to, to negotiate on and, and talk about. Okay. It's all about advocating for the same goal which is about we need to put more resources, you know, to the agency in order to see this project and other projects really funded, not only for the present, but also for the future generation. Uh, we protect the bike lane. What happened uh, at the end of last year, we get less protected bike lane than the previous one, than it was in a schedule. I mean, I think last year we had around 20 miles, and the year before, wondering if someone could remember. You know, one thing I have often said about bike lane miles is the mileage is important, but the quality is also important. And some stretches are take more work and more engineering than others. And, you know, the one I like to cite, because it's one of my favorite stretches, is we added a very small piece of bike lane, two-way bike lane, from the Brooklyn Bridge along Park Row in front of City Hall, and then connecting to all of Lower Manhattan. It's, it's like a quarter of a mile. But getting the engineering right, dealing with the traffic, being in front of City Hall, working with council members, with NYPD, with the press, it's, pro it's proved an incredibly vital connector. But it took some time to get right. So I think it's a balance. I agree with you. We want to continue to try and up the mileage. But I also want to try and make sure that we're doing key connectors that can really be transformative in the bike network. And do we, oh, yeah, wait, I have the numbers here. Oh, yeah, so this year it was 20, actually, this year it was 20.3 protected lane miles. Last year was 20.4. 2017 was a big year for us. It was 25. The previous year, though, was 18. And, you know, prior to the de Blasio administration, the city was averaging about six protected lane miles per year. So, you know, we're averaging now over 20. I, th I think we're making good progress. Agree always more to do, but we've, we've really upped that pace. I mean, the plan for last year was supposed to be 24, so we did not get to the 24. Uh, so we just got those 20, and, and I think that, is, and I understand, I agree with you that should, the quality is important, but you know, I don't see as a contradiction the quality and the quantity, because even though, you know, there's a lot that we have to celebrate on how working together the, the mayors and the council being able to accomplish, but also 
you know, getting to the bike 20 years ago was more something that was more the middle class. That's why with the, with the uh, bike, a uh, city bike, uh, as it was created from the beginning, was only thinking about the center Manhattan. And for me, it was about the vision mainly for the middle class. And what we have seen is about the expansion of cyclists in the last 15 years. Therefore, you know, we also need to be more aggressive when it comes to expanding the number of, of protected bike lanes. So just, I think just, uh, Mr. Chairman, at least checking, sort of looking back at our program, I think we, we pledged to do 10, 10 miles protected lanes. We're, we, we've done 20 the past two years, 25 the year before. We do want to do more, but, you know, again, one thing I would ask particularly, um, you know, as, as you and the speaker have been talking about doing 50 or 100 protected bike lane miles, that is something where I really, really would need some, ca some council partnership and council members to sort of bring me their thoughts of, you know, where are places in their districts where they would really be ready to enthusiastically help us sort of produce protected bike lanes at that pace, because, you know, as I like to say, one, you know, one mile of protected bike lane in Manhattan, it would be 20 north-south blocks. And, you know, if you picture going from 14th to 34th Street, we want to make sure that kind of a distance, we're getting it right, we're getting the street design right so that it's safe for both the cyclists, the pedestrians, the motorists that we're working with local businesses. So, you know, just want to make sure as we do protected bike lanes, we do them and they're safe and they're high quality. And we are in the same, you know, line. So with that direction, when will we get the north side diamond protected bike lane? That is a very good question, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry, I do not have an answer for you on that yet today. I certainly know it, we both know what a challenging issue that has been to resolve. Um, well, that's in, that was included in the inward rezoning. And, he, and if something that we sign, you know, with, in the whole process, something so small, something that we are not able to really follow and honor that agreement, why should I have any confidence that the other project will also be honored. So this was not something that, you know, it was only conversation on the bike lane. This was one of the area agreement on the inward rezoning was to build the north side of Dagman as a protected bike lane. And I feel that it is for me very uncomfortable that still today, as we are getting into you know, the spring and the summer, we, not you, we playing game. If I cannot trust that the protected bike lane, small things should happen, I should not have any trust that the other thing that is put in the letter of the pre mayor will also be honored. And as that process going right now through a lawsuit, I have really doubt then that I can have confidence in the whole inward rezoning. And I hope to get an answer from City Hall before in the next few days. Commissioner, on how is DOT a looking at resiliency challenges as we, as you and your team do your redesign plans? Well, I think obviously the biggest resiliency project that's, you know, under consideration right now starting with um, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, one that obviously is a joint effort between DOT and Parks and DDC and the Mayor's Office of Resiliency you know, that, that may potentially be a template for more projects we're going to do around the city in areas that are vulnerable to flooding, looking at ways we can use parks and roadways as potential buffers. As we do now our new bridge designs, we clearly look very much to how can we protect operational infrastructure involved in our bridges if they're movable bridges. Can we move that, inf you know, typically that infrastructure has been low-lying. We are now moving it higher in new bridge designs. We're looking at new materials and methods for making our roadways, uh, you know, less susceptible to flooding. Um, it's a it's an enormous challenge and one that I think all the various infrastructure agencies around the city we meet a lot and talk about and think about best practices and how we can harden our infrastructure for what unfortunately is clearly a changing climate. I, 
I just, again, I just hope that we continue looking at, you know, climate change as it, you know, as we, all of, all, all of us understand that it's real, that is taken into consideration as, as any redesign take place in any. We absolutely are, Mr. Chairman, and, and I will add, obviously, um, you know, the mayor made some recent announcements about some of the other steps the city is taking to continue, you know, there's the infrastructure side, but then there's the also how is the city reducing its own carbon footprint so that we can have less of an impact on the climate. And obviously he talked a lot about what's happening in the building sector, but on the DOT side, you know, and citywide, we're looking ways to continue to reduce the city fleet, to rely more on electric vehicles, to do everything we can to try and reduce our own carbon footprint. Okay. So on, on, on our buses, I think it's good to, you know, to discuss our plan on how to make buses service more efficient and safer, but I also feel that it, for the meantime, we should get more enforcement if we want to see our buses moving faster than what they're moving today. Like, when should we expect to see more enforcement happen so that no one not drivers is blocking our buses in our city. So the mayor has announced and they're up and running NYPD seven new bus lane enforcement teams, which are out ticketing and towing. So that is already underway and we're working with New York City Transit and NYPD to figure out where are the, where are the bus lanes where we're seeing the most obstructions and, and targeting our efforts there. The MTA is also in the process of doing something that I also think is going to be very helpful. We have the city, we have the ability to install bus lane cameras that look at the, you know, that are, <clears throat> excuse me, attached to our poles and are looking at the lanes. The MTA is going to be installing bus cameras on their buses, and they will be able to look out at the, at the roadway in front of the bus and take a picture and issue tickets. So I think that a lot of other cities uh, in Europe and other places also use those bus cameras to keep their lanes clear, and I think that's going to be a big help here in New York when the MTA has that underway. But should, like, the, any data, any information about, you know, cars that have been told or getting ticket, you know, or what should we expect in the next few days or week when it comes to, you know, that plan to... Yeah, let us, I, I, I want to, I need to double check with the NYPD on that, but we can, we can find you some data on that. I, I do know this, they have been greatly increasing their enforcement in bus lanes and have some numbers to show, but sorry, I don't have those handy. Okay. And with it, as you know, we are, I think our you team and our team here, Central uh, Transportation staff being in conversation on the Vision Zero redesign an intersection that we hopefully we can be in the same place uh, and voting at it in the next day of the meeting. Uh, what is your approach or point of view on how much additional funding should also we be looking at in order to have the money to be able to have the plan to redesign all the intersections that we have labeled as danger following the Vision Zero policy. So I, I want to make sure, are you, are you referring first to intro 322? And yes. all right, let, let, me talk, let me speak about that and then, and then we'll come to the financial question. And look, we, we certainly share the goals of the legislation and, and appreciate you know, that the council is ready to engage with the city. You know, I think what we've stated is our concerns. We feel like when we do our, our street redesign projects, we do a lot of the things that the legislation seeks us to do. We, we, we look for all the possible safety and mobility elements we can include, bus lanes, bike lanes, pedestrian islands, you name it. I think we have you know, some concerns. What I have found in my work on Vision Zero projects, the process is often iterative. And it can be a back and forth between community, business leaders, and DOT. And sometimes a project can turn out much better in the long run, it can also be sometimes when we put a project in the ground, we have the opportunity to go back and revisit and improve it. And I think we felt some anxiety about at a particular moment in time having to declare yes or no on a particular element stated in black and white. I understand from the advocacy point of view, they think that's gonna help them make the case. I think we had some anxiety that may also help opponents of these projects and have some 
legal ramifications. But again, happy to continue to work with you all and see if we can find language we all agree in. It, we certainly share the goals of the legislation. On the sort of the larger funding question, I mean, I think, again, as I, I stated the number, DOT is getting in a 10-year period $2.8 billion for Vision Zero work, and a, and a big proportion of that funding is for street redesigns. And I, again, I'm appreciative for the council and the mayor. I think we've gotten, you know, very robust resources to do that work. I understand the council is interested in seeing more, and, and I presume that's a discussion that will be had with the administration, and obviously we'll be, we'll be happy to participate in that. Has the DOT uh, identify all danger intersection in our in the throughout the well, and I think I, I, I point up there to our you know what we we called our our borough pedestrian safety action plans, and, and as you know, we recently released an update, and it identified you know within the city that approximately seven percent of the roadways and intersections are responsible for nearly fifty percent of the pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries. So as we've always said in our work, those are the areas where we target resources. And as I uh, reported when we did that first series, we put a lot of effort into those areas and we saw dramatic declines in fatalities, better declines than we saw in other parts of the city. So, you know, and we got to, in the first four years of those borough pedestrian safety action plans, 90% of the priority corridors and intersections that we listed, we did some treatment there. In some cases, it was big redesigns. In some cases, it was simpler things like signal retimings and LPIs. So our goal ongoing is to continue to hit at those key quarters. And again, it can be seven, eight percent that are responsible for such a big amount of fatalities. The, the big ticket part of this work is always the major capital projects. And as I mentioned in this testimony, we're adding 80 million for Northern Boulevard. You know, to do big capital work, you get into the tens and the hundreds of millions. And again, I think a, a discussion the administration is happy to have with the council, but it, it starts to become something that, that involves a lot of resources. How, how, what is the type of assessment that DOT, how does DOT identify, like come out with that conclusion with that 7%? Is it based on data from the Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, looking, like, it's looking at crash data and where we see fatalities and serious injuries. And, you know, and, and I think the results wouldn't, you, you know, we have, you can see, well, if you look up, this is a different map that sort of shows some areas where we want to make the bike network ro more robust. But I think the results, and you all have looked at the maps, I mean, they tend to be on big, big arteries that carry a lot of traffic that are very wide, that are not pedestrian and cyclist friendly or busy complicated intersections. Those are the places where we tend to see a lot of fatalities and where we think our interventions are most needed. Agreed. So this is one of those areas that hopefully, you know, we will continue conversation and see how we can uh, work together. With Vision Zero outreach funding, uh, can you please describe Vision Zero outreach effort and how much funding was I invested by DOT in 2017, 2018? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll have Elizabeth pull, I think you mean our media work, and I will have Elizabeth um, pull up those numbers. Uh, I think it was around four million, here she's, oh, let, here, why don't you read it? Um, the, this year, this year we've only, we've only been able to repurpose 2.2 million in our budget. Last year was 4.5 million. Previously, about 5 million. Um, when that was, we were getting resources from both additional resources from the administration and from the council. And, and I know, Mr. Chairman, and, and certainly this, the topic of this of the public education campaigns has come up this year within the administration, as we, as we have seen, unfortunately, an increase in fatalities. And I think it's something where the administration certainly wants to talk to you about it. You have been a terrific champion for us on that, and we're very grateful. Okay, so hopefully we, we my colleague here, also someone that we've been working together, and we will continue working together with this in many, in his also local issue with the plaza. Hopefully, you know, let's look at how, you know, through the negotiation, there's an increase of funding for the Vision Zero outreach funding, because I, as a, just walking or driving in the street. There's no doubt that there has not been the same numbers of ad that we have seen in billboard, that we have seen in the back of the bus, that we have seen in the TV. So, and, and I always say that one of the reasons why uh, the anti-smoking campaign for me work 
is because people were able to see the images or the result of someone that cook that was smoking. And I think that I think through throughout the work that we've been doing, uh, led by you and your team, I think that we were able to see more educational pieces in the street. So hopefully, you know, in this project, there's a a, a inc increase of funding for for the Vision Zero outreach funding. Uh, in March 2019, the state approved a recent renewal and expansion of the speed camera program, which has been operating in the city since 2014. As a result, DOT plans on installing 300 speed cameras in fiscal 2020. It, and, it, and you also mentioned in your opening, in your uh, presentation, but have location been selected for these additional cameras? And if so, how were they selected? So you're right, as I mentioned in my testimony, and again, I want to thank the council because the, the work here that the speaker and the council did with the mayor and the governor to kind of rescue the program uh, last summer when the, the state failed to reauthorize it was absolutely crucial and it has enabled us to keep on track to procure these next 300 cameras. The expansion that we just got for the program up in Albany, I have to say, is very unprecedented. We will now have far and away the largest speed camera program in the United States and, and probably one of a handful of the largest in the world. We have always been careful to, and the legislation requires us to install the cameras where we see the most crashes and speeding around schools. And we have had a very careful methodology there and tried to be very fair and thoughtful in where we've placed the cameras. Um, you know, we are putting together some scenarios of where we would install this next set of cameras, but I will also say we obviously are happy to hear from council members. If there are places where you think, you know, a school area could benefit from a camera, we, we want to hear, we want to hear about that. Okay. On, on pedestrian bowlers at 42nd Street, or the area, of course, we work together as, you know, uh, with the 40. There, I believe when, when the pedestrian bullets were installed, but still when I pass by through all those movies theater, uh, 42nd Street, to see that those movies theater are not protected and vehicles continue to use as a weapons of mass destruction. When do we expect, first of all, what is, where are we with the funding that we allocated to, for the pedestrian bullets? And when will we expect, you know, a increase of those pedestrian bowlers to be installed in yeah. areas such as Forty Second Street in Florida? And I think, refresh my memory, the dollar was it a hundred? Was a hundred million? Was what we invested, Elizabeth? And, you know, I think that work is now DDC contracts because particularly in areas like Times Square, it's it, you know there's some complexities to installing that infrastructure. There's a lot of infrastructure underneath. I know we're starting to see ballers, for example. I think they're going up at at St. Patrick's. Um, I'll, let me see if we have the, if we have a 42nd Street. Oh, here we go, yes. St. Patrick's is in construction, Rockefeller Center is. Times Square is in construction, but I think, I, I don't think you'll start to actually see the bollards till a couple months from now. But that work is underway, as is the Flatiron Plaza. Okay, so that's one area that probably, well, let's see how we can also get a briefing and we see then yeah it, okay the yes board. i think probably a separate briefing yeah. where we we can go through all the locations with you would be helpful so my last one is on opportunity for women and minority how is dot doing how can we do better on disseminating opportunity uh, for women and minority to take advantage uh, uh, at DOT. Yeah. I'm gonna talk a bit about that generally and I'm gonna have Elizabeth will pull out the more granular numbers. And I'm happy to say we were at least this year in the top five of city agencies and MWBE contract awards. It's one area where the mayor and the council have really challenged us to do better. And you know we have particularly on the DOT front, one, one challenge that all the big city capital agencies have is for better or for work, a lot of the large capital contracts go to the big construction firms in the city, and there are very few of them that are women and minority owned. So we're doing a lot of work to try and bring those firms together with subcontractors and to also help those subcontractors get in to understand how we operate to see what kind of opportunities there are for us. We are setting, you know, as I testified before, obviously we're doing a very big expansion of our PedRAMP program and working with DDC, we are setting some very aggressive MWBE goals there. We think that's an area 
ped ramp work, but we can bring in a lot of smaller women and minority owned firms and give them some very big opportunities potentially as prime subcontractors. And I think Elizabeth can give the full numbers here. Sure, in FY19 so far for micro purchases, our goal is 45% and currently we're at 60%. For small purchases, our goal is 50 and we're currently at 52. And for our formal contracts, we projected a goal of 23% and we're at 13% so far. Dollar amounts, dollar amounts. The dollar amounts of each of those? Yeah, let's do it. What do we have? Um, yeah, the micro purchases is under 20,000. No, no, what, what, oh, these? what are our dollar amounts? Oh, not registered. Um, $33 million has been is the committed MWBE amount in, um, in the formal contracts so far. I would like to see how we can uh, partner with some initiative where we can probably think about doing like an information section where we can, you know, bring, as you say, the biggest one and the smallest one for whoever would like to hear on how to establish, you know, some network because I feel that even though the city you know, we have that approach. There's still a lot more has to be done in I, order to... We yeah. agree there is more that needs to be done. We do a lot of informational sessions. And one thing we have done for, for some of your colleagues, both council colleagues and, and state elected colleagues, we can come to your districts, if, particularly if you have local MWBEs who want to do business with the city, want to do business with DOT, want to figure out how to get their foot in the door, we're happy to come and bring our experts and sit down and help strategize and talk to them about ways that they can, you know, get in on some city contracts. We, we would welcome your help there because we do think we agree we want to have better outreach to firms all over the city. Okay. Will you play any role with a, a new law that will mandate it for the school bus to have? I, you know, we, we haven't, we haven't, that's, we understand there's an agreement up in Albany. I don't think we've, I'm looking over at this, I don't think we've seen the final bill language yet, so I'm not sure. I think it is going to be largely a DOE um, program, but obviously, since we have experience with cameras, we'll, we'll be ready to assist them in any way that they might need if, if they want that for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we have questions from Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmember Miller. Thank you to the chairs. And I want to start, I only have three minutes here, so I want to start with uh, any update you have on the LPI. Uh, we've been, the LPI program extending the ability for bikes to be able to use the leading pedestrian intervals. Um, and there was a study that was done. If you can kind of speak to that, that'd be great. We, we conducted a study, I think we looked at 50 intersections where we specifically signed and allowed um, cyclists to travel with the walk signal as opposed to the, the green signal for vehicles. There's one I'm very familiar with in Brooklyn, which is right at Smith Street and uh, Atlantic, where a lot of cyclists gather. And we have not released the results yet. We're still working with, with NYPD on sort of putting out that final report. But I'll, I'll just say this. I think I'll characterize the results as encouraging. Mm, I think we, you know, we felt good about what we saw there in terms of safety. And um, you know, hopefully, we'll have permission to put that report out soon. Wonderful, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, and I want to join you in that effort to get those, those uh, the data out. Uh, I will say this to the chair, and uh, actually both chairs today talked a little bit about LPIs and how those things um, that are coming into our communities make our, our inter intersections safer. This study allows us to kind of see bikes uh, also utilizing that to make things safer for our riders. And uh, I'll be pushing for the piece of legislation to move forward out of committee and, and, and to pass it. And hopefully that can help pressure uh, the, the holistic administration um, coalition to release that information. Um, I think the other, the other thing I want to talk a little bit about are the, uh, the kind of mentions or not, lack of mentions on the BQX and if you can kind of give us a sense about what what's happening in terms of DOT kind of preparing for anything most of the budget stuff has been at EDC mm -hmm. uh, but with uh, the deputy mayor Alicia Glenn leaving kind of curious to see what's happened since then we're gonna have a bigger public hearing yeah. later in the month and we're looking forward to having you and others uh, talk a little bit about it, but if there's anything that you can kind of talk about in terms right, of no, budget. And, and I think obviously we have new Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean who's come in and, and I'm scheduled to speak to her and, and sort of get up to speed. I think 
we will, you know, certainly the administration will have more to say at the hearing that you're conducting later in the month. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the, I think the most recent milestone you sort of saw in BQX was a decision to go forward with an environmental impact statement, and we have an expert on board, uh, on board at DOT, Chris Rones, who I, I think you yes, know from his right. work. He's come back to the agency, and he's obviously someone well-known in Brooklyn who worked on the, you know, all the downtown Brooklyn efforts. So Chris is spearheading this for us, and, and we look forward to coming back in a couple of weeks, I think, with a lot more to say, not much to say. Wonderful. Uh, and the last thing I want to say are, are, are things I want to kind of point to are the ferries, and thinking about ferries not just as the, the spots for for connection to ferries, but the infrastructure around it. Is there a sense of budget that you're thinking about uh, that will help pedestrians get to ferries? I'm thinking about Red Hook and Sunset Park. Of course, I, have to, I, I get the privilege of having two of these beautiful pieces of infrastructure. Um, but if there's anything that you can kind of point to that looks at at the connection and your, co and your connection with, you working with EDC to think about the t DOT component to connecting people to ferries. Yeah, I mean, at all the different ferry landings, we go in with our, our bike and pedestrian teams and sometimes also our sort of transit teams if, if, there's, if there can be, you know, bus connections. And, um, you know, try and see what we can do to sort of improve the land side connection piece. If there are particular things at Red Hook or Sunset Park, you know, improvements you think we should be looking at, happy to come do that. We've, you know, one area, for example, we spent a lot of time improving the area out in the Rockaways where it was not, it was not sort of safe and inviting for pedestrians to get to the ferry. But, you know, if there's more work you think we need to do in your district, happy to come take a look. Hey, thank you. Um, Councilman Miller. Thank you, Chairs. To the Chairs, uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. I was really all set to ask questions about um, congested pricing and uh, bus redesign and so forth, and then we get hit with BQX and ferries, and, and I want to say that the theme of this year's uh, budget response from the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus is equity, and I just don't see the equity there that, that we are willing to spend exorbitant amount of monies and ten dollar subsidies um, to duplicate services to communities that quite frankly don't need the subsidies and we fight for fair fares and we fight for equity in other areas there this is just not what i was expecting to to hear um, from you or the admin but let me digress and Talk a little bit about bus redesign, which I'm very happy to hear about and, and, and just excited and, and, um, and want to see what the city's efforts are in that part and, 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 and particularly what role DOT will be playing uh, in that. Yeah, and, and look, we were very excited. We, we joined with the MTA, with uh, Pat Foy and Andy Byford, I guess now it was about two months ago, the kickoff in Borough President Katz's office. And this is an area where DOT and New York City Transit are working together very, very closely, looking at ridership, traffic patterns, roadway design, safety considerations. You know, the MTA is, New York City Transit is taking rightly a very deep dive now in all the bus routes, which many of which is, as we all know, haven't been changed, you know, in many cases since the 40s and 50s and the era where we, where we did away with trolley cars in New York City. And now we have a chance together to look at ridership patterns, look at growth patterns where we're seeing new development, new businesses, and figure out, you know, particularly from the DOT point of view, looking at roadway design, how we can, in some cases, straighten routes, make them faster, make them safer. And we're very, very excited about the Queen's work. And you, you, you did mention, uh, Council Member, congestion pricing and equity. I, I did just want to say, I think, at least one good thing that came out of the congestion pricing negotiations up in Albany, my understanding is an agreement with the state on some more robust funding for fair fares and, you know, a number of new bus services. So, you know, at least there will be some, I think, some good that for your district will help, you know, create some more affordable and faster journeys into the central business district. So the, the good thing is, and, and, and hopefully by virtue of the working group that we put together that we certainly invited you to be part of, but also some, there are some experts, advocates, and others, including myself, 
who, who thought that in advance of congested pricing that there need to be an independent commission or authority or agency that would oversee. And I'm a little disappointed to see an arm or an umbrella of the MTA um, having oversight of, of the resources there in, in being uh, bridge and tunnel. Um, although they generate the majority of the revenue, um, are you, are you are you, is the city uh, concerned or do you believe that the city uh, from a planning and policy and accountability standpoint that, you, that we are equal partners in congested pricing? Considering the chain of command and who's at the top. Right, I, I don't know that I would say that we were equal partners. I don't, I don't think that's how the legislation got passed up in Albany, but I would say this, I do feel like we are partners. And, and as I said in my testimony, the city and the MTA have been working well together. You know, Chairman Pat Foy, I think, has been very open and communicative and interested in city priorities. But, but I, I think, Council Member, that you're right, that as the congestion pricing policies get formed, the, the toll policies, the exemptions, I think all the questions that are going to be on the table, the city should band together and have a powerful voice. And I, I know the leaders here in the Council will want to be a part of that, as will the mayor. And uh, so, you're talking about curb, some, some of the curbing program, curbside programs. There are a number of areas in outer boroughs that um, have, obviously the, the, the responsibility of the curbs belong to the city, sidewalks, homeowners. There's been a lot of, uh, we have different um, programs that address that, but there has not been a, a robust sidewalk, uh, curbside program that kept up. So. Uh, uh, homeowners are forced to do work on sidewalks and, and don't have curbs. Uh, I know in Queens, we, we've, we've been waiting uh, a number of years. I was told that it was done by community boards, but in Southeast Queens, we've been waiting a number of years and there's not, there's not been an equitable um, investment to service those homeowners, considering that homeowners is a, a tax paying steady revenue and, and, and very little in this budget reflects um, home ownership, and we're hoping that we could expedite and move that along and, and, and making that a more but robust program around that area. I, I would understand last year the, the contract defaulted or something, and, and that kind of pushed back. I'm hoping that we can get them to Queens sometime in the near future. And I'm, I'm sorry, just in the interest of time, um, I did also want to, I know we had also in the past had really good conversations and began some good conversations and brought in some, uh, I think, some really reputable um, uh, MWBE contractors, general contractors, wanted to know where that was going. And I appreciate a lot of the entry level uh, talk that, we're saying, that we were talking about, but there are national firms that could certainly do the, do the work at these levels. I'm, I'm hoping that we can continue that. That is absolutely important. And then finally, um, I'm, I'm, have a really realistic conversation about the viability of something like v BQX and ferry service in terms of investment. And it was a question that I asked, I think, at, at, at Borough Hall, and I continue to ask about the actual equitable distribution of, of, of how much real investment has gone into um, uh, bus lanes uh, and, and um, technology around that, uh, synchronizing lights and so forth and, and so that we can get it. And once again, I, I appreciate you being here. That's uh, my question. I'll, 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 try and, I'll try and get to as many of them as I can. And I, I think I'll, you started with curbs and, and I hear you. It has been an area of frustration and it's interesting. I've gotten to go with the mayor to town halls, you know, in all, almost all council districts now. And it's something we hear time and again. And it is a weird quirk of the way the, the the laws of the sidewalks of the city are the owners own the sidewalks, the city owns the curbs, and, and it's not an area the city has made a lot of investments in in recent years. I, I take your point there. I think it is something that is definitely ripe for, for further discussion uh, in this budget process. Um, you know, just one challenge I think we're facing, the city has such big capital needs right now, and you know, I think as the mayor said in his own budget statement, very much prioritizing NYCHA repairs, affordable housing, the, the borough-based jails, sort of those are some big items and trying to fit everything else in on top of that has, you know, I think obviously a, a source of discussion. Um, 
All right, well, I, I, do, I do have the number here. Elizabeth just handed me the number. So the, ca the city's capital investments on the bus side have been nearly um, half a billion dollars. So we are putting a lot of resources into buses. I take your point, though. I think there is more to be done, certainly more to be done in your district. And one other piece of the sort of the congestion pricing partnership with the MTA, we formed a bunch of working groups on the infrastructure and tolling policy and you know the legal things, I think all the things you expect. We've also for created a working group called Day One, which is asking the question on day one that congestion pricing comes into effect. You know, how will we how will we be prepared, we in the MTA? What kind of bus service and other things will we have on the ground? So there is an aggressive effort there to look at that question, and obviously a district like yours is one where I think we will certainly want to make sure we've got some things on the ground. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Koo. Uh, we, we were joined by Councilmember Gibson and, of course, Councilmember Koo. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Rodriguez. Especially with Chair Drum, every day you're here, <laughs> spend so much time. And thank you for Commissioner Trottenberg coming. Uh, I always uh, admire your work. That if you can weigh your agency, your agency will receive a high rating from me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I have two questions for you. For you or, uh, before I ask you, I have to give you some background first. So in my office, we always receive uh, multiple complaints. Uh, regarding broken, uh, broken bus pass in our district. Uh, when we report these uh, issues to DOT, uh, we receive the same response. You know, there's no capital funding for bus pair, bus pack repairs. Broken bus packs pose an imminent uh, danger to safety of the vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles. Just as a pothole imposes safety hazards, these bus packs should be repaired with the same urgency as other broken infrastructure. So the question is, will the $20.3 million increase in funding for roadway repair, maintenance, and inspection over the, uh, cover the repair courses for the bus pass in the city? I think the, the, the roadway budget is typically done that's in-house resurfacing. My understanding on the bus pads, I'm just gonna double check with the staff here, that we've traditionally done as a separate contract because it's concrete work. And, and I think you're right, council member, I think we have not had a contract the past couple of years, if, I'm, if, re if memory serves. And I think, I think you're right that it is a good topic for this budget discussion, because we agree, we think they're incredibly important for bus service, for the safety of the roadway. So I'm just double checking. Wait, maybe someone has some better news than what I just said. All right, well, if you want to ask your next question, we'll, they're double checking on the bus path. Okay, so you get back to me, right? So the, the second question I want to ask is about the TSP, the transit signal priority. You know, downtown Flushing, we have the uh, uh, multiple bu bus lines, like 20 something lines, and there's an undeni undeniable need for a system to alleviate the traffic. Uh, so if TSP is working, uh, for us, it would be very nice, but, but somehow the city roll out this at a very slow pace and places like downtown flustering uh, with more than 20 bus lines are still suffering from severe traffic congestion. Uh, so uh, the council's request for TSP was not addressed in mayor's executive budget, but items such as uh, upgrades in parking meters uh, features, uh, marking, uh, parking meter features, even though it's convenient, do not take an active measure in immediate, on immediate issues, such as uh, traffic congestion. So uh, why are we putting a total of $7.5 million on parking meter upgrades when there are more pressing transporta transportation priorities, such as signal optimization? So it is a balance, and, and I do want to say, and I, I, you know, I take the, the council's criticism that I think if you go back about five or six years, DOT was still learning how to do TSP, and I think it was taking us a long time and it was costing us too much money. We are now, I think, going at about four times the pace that we used to, and we found a lot of ways to streamline the engineering and I think be a lot smarter about it. And my understanding is that flushing is one of the areas that we are prioritizing, given all the traffic challenges you have there. 
In terms of the meter upgrades, I think just to sort of reiterate in my testimony, one of the reasons we think that's important is in the long run, the system that I think will particularly get at an issue that we hear a lot about, which is placard abuse and fair parking policy, is to have a fully automated electronic parking system where license plates are entered in, where all our meters can read the plates, and that will sort of take away, I think, what has sometimes been kind of a discretionary element in terms of placard enforcement. You're right, it, 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 it's, you know, it's gonna cost some money to do that work, but I think it will actually pay big dividends in the long run in terms of congestion reduction in the city. But obviously something where, you know, open to negotiation with the council if you all think we need to shift those priorities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, <laughs> I'm sorry. Nice. Council, uh, Chair uh, Rodriguez. Yeah, Just a few more questions, Commissioner. On issue one, is related to the potholes. How are you doing today, this year, compared to last year, and what challenges have DOT faced because it is past winter, and how many more have to be done, you know, in the next few weeks or months in order to deal with the pothole that, you know, we don't control about climate change and the top winter creating our streets. Yeah, and I, and, and I think one of the, just to contextualize a bit, I think one of the things we're proud of and, and one of the success stories, again, from the city and the council is a lot of that resurfacing work that we have done over the past five years has meant that overall, we have seen a drop in potholes that need filling. Because I mean, potholes obviously are a symptom of roadways often that need major repair. So I'm looking at our numbers here for, um, let's go ca for calendar year uh, 2019. So far citywide as of the 6th, we're up to 111,000 pothole fillings. And, and you are correct, we are having a tough pothole season. We've had when the weather turns cold and then warm and then cold and you get a lot of rain, it definitely creates potholes. This is our season where we fill them aggressively, but it is also the season where going to the roads, I think one of the questions the council was interested in is sort of repeat offender potholes. When we see a place where we come back year after year and we're seeing a lot of potholes in the same spot, that tells us that it's a roadway that needs resurfacing or in some cases reconstruction. We, we try and look at those roads where we're seeing the repeat offenders as roads that you know, generally probably need a more intensive level of, of reconstruction. Have DOT been looking at also the materials, the type of materials used for resurfacing, again, so that when the street or the avenue it, it are resurfaced, that the time that it doesn't have to be resurfaced, let's say a year or two from there, but that he stayed longer? Yeah, I, I, this is a question I've had in the past. I mean, I think we feel like we, the New York City, we use some of the very highest quality asphalt. And as you know, we have our own asphalt plant, which is actually a tremendous advantage for the city because we're not totally at the mercy of the marketplace. In, in places where I think we see repeated failures, again, I, I think it, it often has less to do with asphalt quality and more to do with that the underlying roadway conditions are poor. And you know, one of the places I think we see those repeat offenders most often in places where there have been street cuts. You know, often when there's been DDC work or utility work and the roadways cut into, it, it can be very hard to fully restore the integrity of the road. And those are places where we're particularly often trying to focus our resurfacing work. I gotta bring some of those avenue and street that I have in my district, you know, to you team that I feel. Right, of course, as I would say this to you and all the council members, of course, if you see places where you need us to get to work, well, bring them to us, bring them to the borough commissioners and, and we'll put them on our rotation. That's great. The, the, on the, the 207 bridge, uh, I would like to see how you can look and talk to the administration because again, that area with the rezoning of Inwood thousand of new units will be built in the next few years. I know that Councilman Cabrera also has been engaged with some developers in the other side to the Bronx, but that bridge at 207 is old, is too narrow, is tough for drivers when they, or buses to when they pass by from in the Fordham Avenue to 207. 
So if, can you look and see if there's any assessment that can yeah, be Yeah, and, and let me see when it's potentially on the schedule for reconstruction. I and mean, we are aware on both of the northern Manhattan side and the Bronx side, lots more development coming. So you're right to sort of point out that's a bridge we, we should take a look at. Sidewalks. Who is responsible for sidewalks in the city of New York? Generally, it is the building owner. Sometimes the building owner is the city of New York, but if it is a private owner, then it, the private owner is responsible for the site. Isn't that, that the private owner or the business owner, they're responsible for the first three feet and that the city... Right, the, 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 as, we, as I was saying with Kelsey Murville, the city is responsible just for the strip of the curb, so just because we like to do things in a complicated way, but the, the rest of the sidewalk is the responsibility of the building owner. But the largest area is the responsibility of the city, right? No, the, the small area is the responsibility of the city. The large area is typically the responsibility of the building owner. So who is responsible for the sidewalk to be safe and basically used by pedestrians? I mean, again, it is, it is the responsibility of whoever owns the building. The city, I think, has an overall responsibility to try and facilitate safe sidewalks and now particularly to focus on making sure that sidewalks and pedestrian ramps are ADA compliant. But I think in a city this large, we need that participation from building owners as well because it is a multi, multi-billion dollar job to keep all our sidewalks in a state of good repair. I know the question has been asked from time to time, should the city just take over all the sidewalks? And you know, that's something that could be legislated, but the financial implications of that are, are just very profound. My feeling is that there's too many agencies. Let's say it, it's like one agency throws to the other one. Let's say when, and, and again, probably your staff, they would know, here has come again, one particular sample, one San Nicolas Avenue, 180 to 181st, basically, People are taking this, most of the sidewalk to put like good in the street to sell. They also are using a space in the street. So if we want to make the city more walkable, which is our agenda, you know, who is responsible to make those business owners accountable to be sure that most area of the sidewalk are used I'm sorry, yeah, I re that's a, you're asking a different, that, that is actually Department of Consumer Affairs has the jurisdiction over businesses when they encroach on the sidewalk, how much they're allowed in terms of putting their goods out on the sidewalk. So, but we can be a part of that discussion too. We sometimes work with them on this, but they have primary jurisdiction. Okay. Link NYC, even though it's Department of Technology, because they also use sidewalk, does DOT play some role? or coordination with the Department of Health. I mean, we, we certainly have worked and coordinated with them, particularly on the installation and the electrical work that needed to be done and work with them in some cases on siting. But, you know, a lot of those link kiosks were installed in places that originally had been, you know, phone booths. But that's the Department of Technology is the one who worked with it's, I, I think it's Link is, I'm looking over our city code, it's do, it's do It, is it Do It? Yes, it's, it's Do It is the ones who chiefly manage that uh, franchise. And the bus shelters, as you know, the bus shelters is the ci is city run through DOT, DOT, and that's another one you know where we have a franchise contract. Yeah. And that franchise, like, are they replacing all those? Have the completely assessment been done in those cases? Oh, that's right. Where we're having the problems with the roofs. Can someone answer that one? Do we know the answer? All right. Sorry, we'll have to get back to you on that, Mr. Chairman. I don't know off the top of it. I know they were inspecting them all, and I think they were pledging to do it pretty quickly. But let's double check that they've done it all. Yeah, I think it's important because, as you know, after those cases that make it to the media, then we got to see other bus shelters that they were basically closed because I will assume that there was some danger in the in the structure. So, whatever well, assessment. Right, they had seen the one. I think it was in Staten Island where they had had part of it had had uh, collapsed. And no, I saw mine at one CTA. Was the one at one And, and so, right, so they had they had taped a bunch of them up until they could make sure they were safe. Thank you. Okay, we just have a follow-up question from Councilmember Miller. Uh, Commissioner, I just, while we were speaking here, I just received an email from some of my colleagues in Southeast Queens and stateside, as well as in the council, and they were uh, looking to um, facilitate a meeting to have a conversation about the 
um, Belmont racetrack redevelopment. And I, I know it's been some conversation in the past. So number one, uh, the willingness to meet. And secondly, what work has been done um, in, in the planning and design as it pertains to this impact on uh, Eastern Queens. Yeah, no, happy to do that. And, and we had obviously received correspondence. It's a state project, but we had received the request that the city be looking at some of the local traffic impacts in the city, and, and we've agreed to do that, and happy to come and update you all on that work. Has anything begun just thus far, or is it just? I, I think they're still in the planning stages, and we're, again, looking at what potential impacts would be. Again, happy to come have the team talk to you all about it. Okay, so I just signed on, and I guess you could expect it soon. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner, so just to go back to the Northern Boulevard issue, um, uh, my chief of staff informs me that uh, LPIs was supposed to be installed in the um, budget year 18 by May of 18. Um, is that part of this 78 million in funding for Vision Zero? The, no, I mean the 78 million is going to be for a capital project that we're going to be doing a few years from now. That, that's capital dollars, so we will now be starting the planning process for what will be the permanent capital changes. The LPIs is just signal work that we do as expense work. So is the capital project the 10 islands that you're putting in? No, the, the, the 10 islands we're putting in with our in-house sources. We haven't, we haven't done the full design of the capital project yet. That's gonna take a couple of I years. See. Okay, all right. And then if, if I can also ask you one last question. Um, uh, newsstand kiosks. Who's responsible to remove them? I have two or three of them that um, either never opened or um, opened and then closed pretty quickly because it's outdated. Do you know how we get rid of them? It, let us come talk to you about it. It, it. That is another one, as you know, that is sort of thorny and cross-jurisdictional and involves DCA and, and sometimes also, frankly, City Hall, but, but you know, certainly something. Let's come see if we can figure out the solution on them. Uh, you know, there can... Because okay, so they've been vacant for three, maybe three or four years now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I thank you for coming in. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Hopefully we can fix this situation at Travis Park. Um, and um, what can I say? We, we, we hear you, Mr. Chairman. I think you have a commitment here on the city side. We will do everything we can to try and figure out Travis Park. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to your team as well. Thank you. And, and also, no, it's okay. And then Right, and, and then but the public will not give testimony until uh, May 23rd. Yeah. yeah, okay. Good. And so with that, this meeting is adjourned at uh, 3.12 in the afternoon. Thank you.